workshop is part of the Tri-State SARE Professional Development Project, which is funded through the USDA and Northeast SARE. It's a collaborative project among the universities of Connecticut, uh, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island. <clears throat> we're in the third year of the project, and this year we're focusing our efforts on pasture management and infrastructure. Today we're welcoming two speakers, uh, both of whom will discuss the types of grazing systems that are seen and can be adopted in our region. Um, unfortunately, one of the speakers who was slated to speak today about multi-species grazing was not able to join us. Uh, so at some point we'll see if we can incorporate some more of that information into our workshops in the future. I'll also mention that we have set three field training workshops uh, for the month of June, July, and August this year. Of course, um, in light of current events, all of those subjects, all those events are subject to change. Uh, so we'll be posting that information on our website and we'll be sending out an email about uh, those workshops as well as the dates. Uh, so certainly mark your calendars, but just keep in mind those dates are all subject to change. <clears throat> And it goes without saying, I guess, today that our participant feedback and group discussion will be structured a bit differently than it normally is. So we're asking everyone who has questions uh, for the presenters to type it into the chat box. And again, uh, on the bottom right hand side of your screen, if it's not there, hover down on the bottom of your WebEx screen and you should see a little, uh, one of those little icons for chat. If you click on that, it will um, bring that box up. So we'll break for questions in between each speaker, and we'll do our best to allow for as much conversation as possible today. But again, I encourage all of you to get in contact with me uh, after today's webinar if you have further questions, and we can get those answered for you. Okay. Um, and obviously our evaluation questions are going to be structured a bit differently today as well. Uh, so we're going to use um, a program called Slido. We're going to do some pre-evaluation questions and then post-evaluation evaluation questions at the end of the uh, presentations today. So certainly take a look at your chat box now. You should be seeing a link uh, to Slido um, that you can click on. Once you click on that, um, the web page will come up and you can enter the access code there, um, capital S-A-R-E. And there's a series of four questions once you get into it. Uh, so answer those four and there should be a bottom, uh, a box at the bottom, a green box that says submit. Um, and then your questions will be submitted for the pre-evaluation. If you have any questions, uh, certainly type in the chat box now and we can help you troubleshoot. I'll give everybody a few minutes to work through those. Um, I'm seeing some results come in on, on that, so it looks like we're all in good shape.
All right, is everybody, hopefully everybody's had the chance to um, enter their questions. Um, so we'll move forward. And again, I am happy to, we can send out this poll um, after today's webinar as well if we need to. So uh, moving forward, I uh, want to introduce our uh, speakers today. Our first speaker is Dr. Joseph Orfis. He serves as a lecturer of, and director of forestry and agricultural operations at the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. He teaches courses in agroforestry and forest management, and he also oversees and applied educational opportunities on the 10,880-acre Yale School Forest System. His research focus is in temperate agroforestry and applied forest management. Joe's most recent work has been in maple syrup production systems and temperate civil pasture. His passion outside of academia is farming, where he integrates agroforestry research into Hidden Blossom Farm, which he owns and operates in Union, Connecticut. So today, Joe is going to be speaking with us on um, silvo pasture and uh, raising our livestock in that um, grazing system. Dr. Justine Deming is our second speaker today. She came to URI in 2018 to teach animal management courses after completing her PhD in Ireland. Her background has been primarily focused on dairy cattle behavior and welfare in dairy farm labor efficiency and management. Prior to starting her doctorate, Justine was an assistant professor of dairy science in central New York at Morrisville State College. While in Ireland, she became interested and involved in grass-based agricultural systems. Two of her favorite courses to teach at URI are ruminant management and pastures and grazing management. Justine values hands-on learning activities and bringing science and technology to pasture and grazing management. She also emphasizes bringing students out to local farms to witness and assess different styles of pasture and grazing management in Rhode Island. So Justine today will be discussing um, several different types of grazing systems that we see in our region. Uh, she'll be our second speaker, so starting a little bit later this morning. Um, but I would like to thank them again for joining us today via webinar. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Joe to get started. Uh, great. Thank you. And uh, yeah, hello, everyone. Um, glad we can connect digitally, if not in person. Um, today, I'm going to talk about silvopasture systems. I just give me a minute and I'll share my screen. Um, someone just confirmed that that went through. Yes, Joe, it looks good. Great. All right. So yeah, grazing silvo pasture. There's there's quite a bit that that goes to this. Um, I mean, I could probably sum up the whole presentation just by saying, if you're good at grazing your treeless pasture, you'll be good at grazing your silvo pasture. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll get into some of the details here. So the outline, I'll talk a little bit about woodland pasture, which I think is really important to differentiate from silvo pasture. I'll go over briefly some silvo pasture systems from the Northeast US that um, I, I documented as part of a study a number of years ago. Um, but I, just for the sake of time, I'm not gonna get into all the details of each one of those. And then I'll, I'll talk about the grazing and livestock components of silvo pastures and things you wanna think about. And then I'll, I'll also discuss some research I did in the past on forest conversion to silvo pasture, which is a much harder thing um, in terms of tree health than planting trees in a treeless pasture. So here we go. Um, yeah, just quick background. We have Hidden Blossom Farm in Union, Connecticut. Um, I had a farm up in the Adirondacks and uh, we moved down here about oh, two years ago to be closer to family. And I took this position with Yale University. So we sold the farm up in the Adirondacks and, and ended up here in Union and uh, happy to be here. 
So we're, we're in the practice uh, process now of getting this farm back up and running. It was mostly raw land with, with one uh, decent sized hay field. But yeah, we raise beef, um, getting silver pastures established. Uh, we also do some vegetables and you'll see figs up in the top corner, which is the namesake of the farm. And then my partner, Lindsay's in there too. And so she, she helps quite a bit. Um, so current on-farm research, um, we have a uh, SARE grant right now to look at establishing trees and agroforestry systems. One is deer protection methods within uh, silvo pastures, but also within sugar bushes and, and anywhere we want to enrichment plant. And then another one is within planting trees. So the bottom left of the screen there, planting trees in a treeless pasture. How do we do that? And, and that's always a question. And in this case, the study is looking at different methods of um, uh, grass competition control. So that's new. We, we don't have a lot of results yet. Um, I have some neat fencing things that came out of that, but in terms of the actual results of the, of the treatments, um, that'll be a couple of years out. So silvo pasture. So what are we talking about? Well, it's the sustainable in, uh, production, integration of livestock, trees, and forage on the same unit of land. So the idea here is that all three components are existing together. And, and um, and that's really key because without one of them, it doesn't, it doesn't fit a silvo pasture and it's not going to be a very functional system. I mean, I guess a treeless pasture is a functional system, but um, you don't get all the benefits of a silvo pasture. So some things that silvo pasture is not, and, and I think it's really important to make this distinction because these, it's just, it's just not the same system. So it's not unmanaged pastured woodland. So you see that in the top left of the screen there, which is just, that's an area where pigs were just left in the woods and they cause all kinds of soil damage and degradation and rooting. And there's parasite problems whenever animals are that close to the soil, although pigs less so. Um, and there's definitely issues with the tree health in that, in that dynamic. So that's not silvo pasture. It's just putting animals in the woods. It's a sacrifice area where you put animals. Um, it's also not the top right corner, which is livestock eating brush. Using livestock as a tool to eat brush or knock it down or as a form of vegetation management may be great. It may be totally sustainable. You may be able to do it well. I mean, I've done it myself and had pretty good success, but it's not a system where you're growing trees for some sort of purpose. Um, and so just having livestock eating brush is not silvo pasture. Um, I'll also point out if you're doing that, you may be messing with your livestock diet a little bit too much, depending on what you're what you're raising. Um, like with cattle, they love to eat brush, but they don't love to eat only brush. And if you only feed them brush, you're going to have problems. Um, I my first herd of cattle up in New York were Highland Scottish Highland, and that was always the the theme was, oh yeah, they can just live off a of brush, and they they really can't. They can well, I guess they can live off of it, but they struggle. They do much better when they have a mix of brush and grass. Um, so just think about that with when it comes to using animals to control brush. Um, and uh, Pete Smallage did some work on this, on a project with Cornell called Goats in the Woods, where if you just fed goats understory brush, uh, they were actually starting to starve them because uh, they weren't getting enough nutrition. Uh, wolf trees in open fields. So this is just like the, the single tree in the middle of the field. The bottom one on the left is up in Maine. The bottom one on the right is in Bavaria that I took last spring. Um, these are just trees in the field. They're great. They're nice to have, but animals congregated around them. You see the exposed roots on the one in Bavaria and you see the crown dieback on the one in the left up in Maine. Um, that's from livestock damage to the roots. And so Wolf trees and open fields aren't bad to have, they're nice to have. Uh, they provide all kinds of wildlife benefits and, and shade for your animals, but because of that concentrated area, it's not a healthy system for the tree. And so it doesn't, and it's just not a dense enough system to meet the definition of silvo pasture. Um, I'll also point out that this woodland pasture is really common. And so this is, these are a set of data which show the number of farms using uh, woodland pasture in 2012 census of agriculture. Um, in Connecticut, we had a thousand farms identifying as practicing woodland pasture, but only 24 of those farms, as you see in parentheses there, only 24 of them self-identified as practicing silvo pasture and or alley cropping, which means a very small percentage of them are 
probably not practicing solo pasture. They're probably just putting animals in the woods, which is very destructive practice. Um, and so here we go. So let's talk about that woodland grazing. Um, root compaction. Here's a, a photo of a farm in, in New York, and I, it's easy to take photos of pigs destroying the woods because they do it so well and so fast. Um, but you can easily do this with cattle too, and, us, and, and other animals, sheep and goats, um, horses for sure. Uh, but you get root compaction, you get girdling, you get soil degradation, especially with sheep and goats and, and other animals. Um, you're going to get parasite problems because they're going to be ingesting a lot of soil, which has parasites on it. Um, it's just a really, really difficult thing. There's a publication down at the bottom I put together a number of years ago um, to differentiate between silvopasture and these wooded livestock paddocks. Um, by the way, I, I start calling these uh, feed lots with trees because that, that's really what they are. You're not animals aren't getting anything out of this, even though the pigs are rooting and they may be getting an insect here or there. In the long run, that becomes a very sterile system with poor soil health, and um, there's not not a lot living there. And so you're bringing, and especially if this were cattle or some sort of grazer, you have to bring food to these animals because there isn't enough food in there. And if you don't bring food to them, you're going to be starving them. And so these are really just feedlots that have trees. So silvopasture is a whole different game. Uh, silvopasture, you have grasses, trees, livestock, all functioning together. It doesn't mean they're all in harmony and they're all always working together towards a common goal. They're not, they're often competing with each other, but it, we are farmers and so we manage them. And, and that's what makes the system function is our active management. Um, so here's just what silvopasture looks like in, or some snapshots of what silvopasture could look like in the Northeast from 20 farms that I went around and documented uh, their silvopasture practices. Uh, some of the research supporters there were the Northeastern States Research Cooperative, which, which was a great funding source for forestry research that isn't available anymore from the Forest Service. Um, University of New Hampshire, where I was, and then Paul Smith College, where I was a faculty member, and they were all supporting this work. Um, so what types of silvopastures were people using? Well. Forest conversion to a uniform tree spacing, open field edges, orchards, living barns, all kinds of things. Um, I'm going to go through some of these tables fast. This is being recorded, so if anybody wants to go back and look at these, uh, you can. Um, this publication is also open source. Um, but yeah, people have goals for their trees as saw timber, firewood was really common goal, fruit and nuts, maple sugar potential. Um, oaks were common, maples, apples, fruit trees. Uh, white pine, those are all the common trees used. Uh, forages, the common forages you see, red clover, white clover, orchard grass, bent grasses, bluegrass, fescue, timothy, these are all the same common forages you're going to see in an open field, um, rye grasses. And then uh, problem plants, multiflora rose, Japanese barberry, Japanese knotweed, oriental bittersweet, buckthorn, honeysuckle, privet, these aren't new to anybody I'm sure who's on this call. So the, the pest species of plants in a silvopasture are the same ones we deal with on much of our farmland. Um, here's some images. So this is a forest conversion in year two with uniform tree spacing. If you look at the tree, oops, if you look at the tree all the way to the right in the image, you'll see that tree has a whole bunch of uh, what we call epicormic branches along the stem. So these are small branches that sprout out from the stem. That's a sign that that tree is stressed. Um, one of the reasons that tree is stressed in, in showing that, some foresters will say, well, you gave it too much light, but in reality, it's, it, that's not actually what's going on. Um, it, what, what's really happening with that tree is the root damage has caused a lot of stress to that tree, and it is sending out its dormant buds as a last ditch effort to make food. Um, the root damage here was done by uh, excavator, stumping the site. So after this was converted from a forest, uh, it was an NRCS project in Massachusetts and the NRCS folks required the farmer to pull the stumps with an excavator. And when you drive an excavator around, you tear up a lot of tree roots. And when you pull a stump next to a tree you're trying to leave, those roots are intertwined. And so you're, you're bound to, to do a lot of damage to your residual tree roots. Um, so while stumping it made, yeah, a nice clear flat um, pasture, it really did a lot of damage to these residual trees. 
So here's the same farm, a different stand, but this is in year one. So you can see all the stumps in there that would have been removed in the previous image. In this case, the farmer did this on his own, and so he's not going to remove the stumps. Um, one thing I point out is if you graze it well, you don't need to clip this in the, in the short future, and um, you don't need to pull the stumps. And I don't know of any livestock that can't walk over stumps. Uh, here's an alpine pasture in Bavaria, just to give you another idea what silvo pasture looks like. This one's also overgrazed. You see really short grasses. Um, but the system in Bavaria was a little different where they would uh, graze it and then they were, really wouldn't go back for like two or three months. They just keep going up the slope. But when you have all kinds of pasture land to just keep going up the mountain higher as the season turns, uh, essentially chasing spring, it's a different system than we have here in Connecticut. Uh, forest conversion, this is a, up in Maine, this is a, a group tree spacing. So in the forester here, or the farmer here took the trees cut groups out of it and left groups of nice trees and uh, and then used round bales to uh, cover up some of these hastened ferns. So this whole understory 50 years, 15 years ago was fern and round bale feeding in the fall and the winter has smothered that fern and got some grasses established. Here's another, uh, this is a variable tree spacing on a syllable pasture in New York. You can see the walnuts in the forefront, but again, a forest conversion. Uh, this is open pasture edge conversion, so I, I know probably everybody on this call has pastures where the edges have creeped in over time because a tree falls and you mow around it and, you know, it's it's June and it's haying season and you're going, going to town and you'll get out and move that branch next time, but you never do. And then the forest just grows in and um, that's, you know, it's such a common thing to, to have our our field edges go all the way into the woods where there's a stone wall. And so what some farmers have done is they've taken that overgrown part of their field and they've thinned it out, left the nicer trees, as you see in this image, the straighter ones, in this case for timber, um, and then cut out the rest. So you get light to that understory. What that does is it gives you a pasture that's really nice in that your animals have a choice between shade and, uh, and sun. And so you get a really nice pasture with this edge of it being silvopasture and the core of it being treeless. And so I like to point out that silvopasture doesn't have to be a whole thing. It doesn't have to be uniform. It can be uh, portions of pastures. Here's another open pasture edge. And what this farmer did was they left the forest uh, thinner, closer to the field, and then denser, closer to the woods. So by the time they got to the edge of the pasture, it was pretty much a full canopy of, of pine in this situation. And that, um, that shaded their fence so they had less weeds and uh, grasses shorting out their electric fence because they had a full canopy. So that, that's one way to do it is have your open pasture edge, silvo pasture gradually get denser to your fence line. This is a black walnut plantation, my uh, research assistant Leanne there. Um, this was grazed by dairy cattle and uh, not, re not um, regularly, but uh, two or three times during growing season up in northern New York. And you can see it's a very dense canopy, but because it's black walnut, black walnut lets a lot of light through its foliage. And so it allows this orchard grass, and there's some vetch in there too, um, but mostly this is orchard grass to grow in that shade. And since it's grazed lightly, there's a lot of energy left to that orchard grass. This is also pretty, pretty prime New York soil. Um, here's another plantation. This is black locust with enrichment walnut in it. So the idea is the black locust produces fence posts and the walnut gets trained uh, to have low, few branches and, and high quality wood. So this is a pasture that was planted, another pasture that was planted to hardwoods. Uh, here's from that same image. This is uh, a real profit from it. And so if we think about how much you can make on some of these hardwood plantations, well, most things that we grow for salt logs take too long to, to make any money. But black locust is one where because you can harvest fence posts in 10 to 15 years, you can get revenue up front or, or in a short time, which adds quite a bit of profit. So the net present value of this system is about $1,000 per acre. And uh, that's pretty good for, for a hardwood plantation in the Northeast. The other thing I'll point out with, with black locust is uh, it's hard to get rid of. So if you're gonna plant a pasture to it, you want to, you're, you're being somewhat committing to it. Um, 
But I'll, I'll also point out that it's native to the US and some people consider it an invasive, but it, it's native range was likely all the way up into Southern New York. So um, it's not that, that crazy of an invasive. Um, but, and then lastly, black locust is, is kind of the, like the organic pressure treated. So if you want wood decking or anything like that, um, or posts that are not pressure treated, locust is a good way to go. So there, there's a, there is a lot of benefit to having this tree on a farm. If, if it fits your needs. Here's what some of those posts look like in a black locust silver pasture being grazed by some meat goats. Um, and what the farmer was doing here was thinning out the crooked, less straight black locust using that for posts and then leaving the straighter ones to be grown into saw logs, which then can be sawn for timber or for lumber for uh, pressure treated alternatives. Uh, here's orchard silvo pastures. So these are just orchards grazed with, with livestock. This one is from Rhode Island and being grazed by sheep. And nice thing about grazing an orchard with sheep is they you can have a lower canopy in your orchard. Um, these are some of my old orchards that I uh, got established up in on the, on the old farm in New York. And uh, I was grazing with cows, so I had to have a much higher canopy. It wasn't a production apple or this was a or, uh, uh, diversified volunteer apple orchard that I would make cider with. And so um, we had about seven acres of this and uh, we were able to, to make cider that was really tasty from a lot of different apples, but I didn't stay there long enough to turn that into a, uh, into like a cidery. But the nice thing is that they're trees and so they're still there on that farm. And what happened here is when the farm was abandoned, it came back to mostly apples. And so I went in and you see in the top right, I chose the best trees. I thinned out the rest. The cows got to eat some buds in the winter, which they sure enjoyed. Um, it's kind of like a little treat. And uh, I didn't feed them just buds. They would die from that. I fed them hay. But um, yeah, and then and then the next year you see how, how soon that greened up and uh, it turned into a nice productive pasture with nice diversified shade that the cattle could enjoy. Um, and here they are talking about the system and how much they like it. Uh, this pecan orchard uh, silver pasture in the south. And so pecan silver pastures are pretty common in, in some parts of uh, the south and the central US. And so it's not crazy to think about grazing animals in an orchard. Nice thing about pecans is they're nut tree, they're tall. And so they work better for taller animals like cattle. Um, these are some grazed orchards in Italy. So this is actually where my family's from, one of the places I saw it first. Um, and this, is, this just was the one image I had with an animal in it, but they were grazing this on a horse, with, with a horse on a tether, but they would also run sheep through these um, olive orchards in this situation. So orchards, and, and here's the uh, Strauss systems in Europe. So Strauss systems, especially in Germany, are what, what's called high orchards. And these are fruit trees, with taller canopies, standard size trees, um, where they graze underneath. And you can see here's a Strauss system from one of my students' farm. She's from Germany, Viola, and um, Europe. And uh, she sent me those photos last year, which were great. Here's another one. Uh, and in this case, the trees have stakes around them, no fencing to protect them from hay equipment. So again, this is, this is Bavaria. But here's one where uh, the farmer, so, so her family owns the trees and the land and, and the cattle are owned by a, a different farmer. And this is one where the other farmer didn't get them out fast enough during wet conditions. And this is an, an uncommon scene, especially this time of year in Connecticut. So if we're thinking about silvo pasture management, get your animals out of those areas when it's muddy because they will do a lot of damage to the roots. And, and that's why this image was taken. So you can see the difference here between where it wasn't grazed during mud season in the, in the back and where it was grazed during the mud season and the damage it's causing to the top of the soil. Um, these are, this is just another one of those uh, apple orchard silver pastures on my place up in New York, but you can see how much forage can grow underneath these trees. The key here is that you don't have a full canopy, you have a partial canopy, which allows light in. Um, outdoor living barns are kind of neat. I'm not going to get too deep into these, but these are areas of dense trees, which are used to shelter livestock during periods of harsh weather. And so they're not a permanent system. 
Um, there's no forage underneath, so it's like the silvopasture that doesn't quite fit as silvopasture. But the thought is that you can put animals in there during shelter. And so it's like a barn, but it's living trees. And um, this farmer uses it in the winter, in the summer when there's a lot of flies to give his, to give his animals a break from flies. And um, I know some other farmers that use them for uh, putting their animals in when there's a snowstorm and then taking them out. What you can't do is you can't leave your animals in there all winter because the manure and any waste feed buildup will uh, smother your tree roots and cause a lot of damage. The other thing you don't want to do is put your animals in there um, when the ground's saturated. All right, so fencing systems, some of the details here. Um, a lot of different fencing systems can work well with silver. So a lot of people like to use living trees. Um, I'm probably one of the few foresters that will say that's okay to do. Um, and just here, here are some ways it can work. Uh, you see the top left corner there. This is a perimeter fence on a silver pasture up in mass. The key with a perimeter fence is having compression springs. And so these compression springs, See the four of them in that image. They allow the fence, the high tensile, this is high tensile electric, uh, to flex. And when a limb falls on this fence, those springs will compress instead of snapping off your um, insulators or anything else. The fence can just stretch. You can go walk it, cut the tree off or the branches off, and the fence will pick up. Um, you know, here or there, you may need to replace a staple or two, but it really works well and your perimeter fence to keep uh, keep it robust to trees, much, much better than barbed wire ever would. Um, the other thing you'll see to the image to the right is portable poly wire. And so I'm a big proponent of doing um, a strong high tensile perimeter fence with portable poly wire divisions. This works well for cattle. Obviously if you have sheep or goats, you need a different type of fence, but um, Strong perimeter, less costly, less permanent um, interior fences tend to tend to work well for grazing management and, and adjusting where you want grazing pressure and where you don't want grazing pressure. Um, by the way, we, we were going to do a fencing clinic up here at the farm this spring, but with the virus, we're going to postpone it. So just keep an ear out. Probably in the fall, we'll do a fencing clinic on how to build fences. I'll show people how to put a fence post right in the middle of a stone wall, which is not really hard to do, but it gives you the opportunity to make your stone walls, your field edges again. Um, and then we'll talk about some different fencing options. So at the, at the bottom left here, these are ex from a company called Expand Fence Systems. Uh, they don't pay me to say that. They, they work pretty good if you want to use keep a living tree as a fence post without damaging it. This is rubber rope like truckers use for tying things down. And then their specialty insulators, which hold the fence up. These work great for just supporting a fence along the line. They don't work very well if you have a lot of down or up pressure on that on that post. Um, but in this case, you can use the living tree, and as the tree grows, it stretches that rubber rope so you don't get any damage to the tree. Um, bottom middle there, this is a system uh, I picked up up at Wellscroft Fence System years ago from from the folks up there. It's a pressure treated or rot resistant piece of wood. In this case, it was Northern white cedar. Um, and you have a galvanized nail, which goes through a fender washer, which goes into the tree. And so your fence insulators are just nailed to the board like they would in any other time. Um, but the board gets pushed out as the tree grows and the board pushes on those fender washers and those fender washers pull on the nail and pull the nail out of the tree. Um, and so that system works really well. So the tree grows, it pushes the board out and you don't get the tree growing into an insulator. The worst thing you can do in a fence is nail an insulator right to a tree because you got about two years and then that insulator is gonna start being shorted out. So this, this system works really well. They last a long time um, because you got a staple and a sliding insulator there. If something lands on that fence, it'll typically slide up as the wire moves, it'll slide instead of pinch, or it may pop a staple, but you can always put that back. Um, bottom right, portable poly netting, it's tough. It may be needed for things like sheep or goats um, or chickens, but uh, in it's a stick magnet 
you pull that stuff through a silvo pasture and you're going to pick up every single branch on the ground. So I strongly suggest if you need to use portable poly netting because you're using um, sheep or goats or, you know, if you're really grazing pigs with it, um, poultry, make alleys that are twice as wide as the height of your fencing and keep them clean of debris. So brush hog them, uh, just keep them grassy. So that way, when you pick up your portable poly net, you're not picking up a whole bunch of sticks. Uh, so livestock and the thing about pigs, you know, I talk a lot about pigs. I just, I'll point out that the bottom picture here is a farm where they raise pigs on the left and cattle on the right. And what's hard about pigs is we always bring food to the pigs. So it's not a hassle for the farmer to have to bring food to the pigs when the pasture gets destroyed because they've been bringing food to them anyway. Whereas with cattle when, or sheep or goats, when, when they run out of grass, it's a cost to us. We have to then buy hay and bring them hay. And so there's an incentive for us to move our animals more when we have cattle or sheep or goats, because if we don't move them faster, it's gonna be a cost in terms of feed and time and all that. Um, the other thing is pigs don't necessarily like to get moved. Most pigs like to have their little home and they like to stay in their home. And so you move them, they may want to go back. So I'll just point out that if you're trying to raise pigs in silvo pasture, you really, really need to be active in your management. Um, I have not yet seen anybody in the States do this well. Um, it's just most people are leaving their animals in until the pasture gets destroyed and then they're reacting and moving the pigs. You really, with any livestock grazing, especially in silvo pasture, you have to be proactive and you have to move your animals before they cause the damage. Because for your trees, once that damage is done, they, that, the damage could be reducing decades of growth or killing the tree. And, and you just don't wanna get into that. Not to mention what's happening with your soil. I'll point out in this bottom image, you see all the loss of soil and you see the addition of rocks. It's not that rocks somehow were more prevalent in the left side than the right side. What happened is the rest of the soil is gone and those rocks are now at the surface. And so it's a rocky degraded pasture because of the pigs, whereas the where the cattle were grazed, it's a much healthier pasture. Again, so that rooting, it's, I'm not saying don't use pigs for rooting. I mean, I've used pigs for rooting up gardens and tilling areas and they work great for it, but that's the intention, right? Is tilling and rooting and all that. Whereas when they're in a silvo pasture, one of our goals is to grow trees and you cannot grow trees when you're constantly letting animals consume their roots or even, even one round of animals consuming the tree's roots will, will do a lifetime of damage to that tree. So a lot of people say, well, it's you know a traditional system. Well, these, this, these are some images I took in um, Portugal of traditional pig silvo pastures. These are called the Montado system in Portugal, the Dehesa in, in Spain. These are acorns, um, cork oak, which is why the trees look naked. They remove the outer bark, but they, they leave the inner bark so the tree stays alive to make cork. Um, cattle and horses and, and sheep are grazed on grasses during the growing season. And then in the winter time, well, actually, the winter is somewhat their growing season too. In the winter time, um, the acorns drop, and so pigs are let into the system for the four months to fatten when acorns are available. So that's the only time pigs are allowed in those systems is when acorns are abundant on the ground. And to a pig, an acorn is much more appealing than a root. Um, these are also drier soils. Um, so they're harder for pigs to root and they're much bigger paddocks. So, I mean, you might have a hundred pigs on oof, 40 acres and that's the amount of area that they're getting. And they're grazing and consuming a lot of, or sorry, they're, they're consuming a lot of acorns and not going after the roots. Once the acorns are gone, the pigs are removed so they don't go and root up the system. So it's a totally different dynamic than what we have here in the Northeast with our uh, regularly wet soils and our irregular acorn crops. So our oak trees only mask every 10, 12 years, whereas these trees produce a big crop of acorns every year. 
is very different than what we have. We may have trees that have acorns. Um, you know, our oaks obviously produce some acorns every year, but not to the extent where there's going to be anything available for livestock. Um, and, and I'll also say that folks putting animals in oak oak stands in the summertime to in claiming they're eating acorns just doesn't fit. We don't have acorns until the fall. So if you're going to try to use animals to consume acorns, you really can only do it in end of September and early October. By the end of October, the acorns are consumed by wildlife and there's there's nothing left. Um, so anyway, I point out these, the Hesa and Montado systems are really neat, but they're very different. And so here's what they look like when they're uh, in the winter time and uh, pigs are, are consuming the acorns. Again, outside of that, it's it's cattle grazing. So uh, back to the U.S. You know, here's some pigs just in the woods. This is not. This is a very different system. Wooded livestock paddocks, feedlots with trees. Here's one with cattle just being left in in a forest. You see the exposed roots. You see girdling on some of these trees. Um, you see all kinds of compacted, exposed bare soil with no forage. So that's not what we're going for. Um, and so. You know, shade is one of the th reasons farmers do things like this, is they want to have their animals have access to shade, and shade's so important. Um, and some companies will promote these shade alternatives. So on the left here, this is a portable shade structure you can drag around your pasture. This is actually at the um, grass-fed green up a number of years ago in New York. And uh, it's just, it was really funny because they had a tree and they had a shade structure. And so the joke amongst our civil pasture crowd there was, um, which one do we think, which which one has happier animals under it? Um, but the, the shade from the tree is a much more natural shade, right? <laughs> I don't know which one animals like, but it's, uh, it's more cost effective too. So anyway, you can have these shade structures, they work, but um, trees also work pretty well. And you can see what my cow thinks about that shade structure. So why graze? Um, well, the, the next talk's gonna get into a lot of grazing too, but um, grazing is important. And so it can also mean cleaner things like milk. So if anybody has a dairy farm on here, you know, it, it's hard to switch from a total mixed ration to grazing, no doubt. But if you're in the grazing realm, um, it tends to lead to cleaner milk. And that, that's because animals are out, sorry, in the rotational grazing realm. I'm, I would imagine continuous grazing, which wasn't part of this study, but continuous grazing may actually lead to dirtier milk, um, just because your animals are going to be in more bare soil. But uh, it's, it's just a healthier system for the animal. Grass is clean. They move from paddock to paddock to paddock, so the paddock can regrow. Um, it's just a nice dynamic. Um, so rotational grazing concepts, right, with a treeless pasture like this one or a silvo pasture, pasture um, the idea is that you're moving your animals in a proactive way instead of a reactive way. And how do you know when to move your animals? Well, you look at grass length. So you don't move them. It's, oh, they're in there for two days or three days or five days. It, it doesn't really work like that. What you need to do is you need to see how the forage has grown and then how it's recovered. And so in this image, you can see on the left, this, this paddock, which sort of extends to the back of the screen, this had been grazed four weeks prior by our cattle. And then the one all the way to the right, which looks more brown, um, was more recently grazed. And this one's a little brown because this is our first year and that field hadn't been hayed. So they were grazing some really stocky stuff. And so what we did was graze it down to about three or four inches or when a lot of it was was knocked down and then I'd clip it with the brush hog and then let it regrow. And so you see at the bottom right here, you see what's being grazed actively, then a little further up in the image the week before, a little further up the week before, and then on the left-hand side is the four weeks prior. And, and that's the idea is you're letting it regrow and, and you don't put animals back to where it was um, grazed until it gets to it desired height. In our case, we're looking for like six to eight inches high. I'd rather have it eight inches high for, for our cattle, graze it down to four inches, three at the low, and then move them to the next one. So there's a lot of art to it. 
Um, but but there is a there is a benefit, and here's a slide on continuous versus rotational grazing, and um, controlled stocking, which is the term that authors are using for uh, rotational grazing, and then constant stocking is their continued grazing. And what you see here, pushing the top chart, is that the um, average daily gain very much dropped in midsummer for constant stocking paddocks because there wasn't any grass left and there wasn't any quality grass left. And so this controlled stocking where they maintained an average canopy height of about three inches, which is a hard way to think about rotational grazing, gave them forage during the summer, which was really valuable and kept their growth going. It also increased the carrying capacity of the land. Um, and so having a higher carrying capacity, especially in the spring, well, this is great. You may not use that higher carrying capacity with um, grazing, but you may use that by clipping it and saving it for the winter. And then at the bottom, you can see the, um, the live weight over the course of the season too, gains per acre. So it's just, there, the science is there, the practice is there. Rotational grazing is far better than continuous stocking. You can see on the image here, um, the bottom image is continuous stocking. The top image is rotational grazing. These, this is the same soil type. Um, it's just, and, and these farms are like 20 miles apart. Um, it's, it's pretty clear that rotational grazing works. Uh, it's also pretty clear that continuous grazing does not. So this is actually another farm. This is up in Northern New York. And this farmer had been grazing cattle in this field for 30 years continuously. Um, when he was a kid, he was telling me that he used to hay this field with horse-drawn equipment. So to hay a field with a horse-drawn, ground-driven sickle bar mower there were no rocks. And he said there were no rocks. He says, yeah, there were no rocks when I was a kid. Well, the reason there's all these rocks in his pasture now is because he's just left animals there continuously for 30 years. And the soil's gone. And all that's left is the rocks. And because there's no nothing growing in those pastures or nothing growing vigorously in those pastures, the roots are gone. And so the freeze thaw cycle brings more rocks to the surface. And I know I'm not the only one on this call who has plenty of rocks on their farm already. Um, so if you want to keep them down below the ground out of your way, you really need to maintain healthy forages in your pastures. And, and that all goes to root growth. Um, this is a really nice image. Um, I think I stole this from uh, James Hyde, who put it on a presentation last summer, but it's just a really good one. Um, percent of leaf volume removed and percent of root growth stopped. So if you remove about 50% of the leaf volume, you're stopping almost 100% of the root growth of your forages. So this is where it's pretty important to maintain some of that leaf volume. Um, I said earlier, I like to graze it from like eight inches to like four inches, three at a minimum. Um, I'm gonna stop root growth for a minute there while that plant recovers because it's only going down to 50%, it's gonna come back up pretty quickly. As soon as it gets to 60%, to 70% back to its volume, it should start putting root growth back um, pretty strongly. But if you graze it down to, to 40, 30% of the leaf volume, which is like two inches on a lot of your forages, you're gonna really reduce the forage's ability to grow roots. Um, just that, that's a really nice table there that I think proves the point of, we don't wanna remove all of the forage that's there. And that's what rotational grazing allows us to do. And so that, that's what, you know, in a civil patch, that's what we're going for. Um, one thing I want to point out on silvopasture, because I know the next talk's going to get into more grazing concepts, so I'm not going to get all into how forages grow and all that. But with silvopasture, one of the things we try to do is keep um, 
grasses in these earlier stages, these leafy stages or food stages at the latest. So that way they continue to regrow and we get a high concentration of carbohydrates and protein. We can do that in a silvo pasture over the course of a summer because the shade will slow down the growth of the grass. And so if we want to pause our grazing, we want to hold, we want to slow our grasses down a little bit, but keep their nutritional content high. We can actually keep them in these leafy and these, these boot stages later into the season when they're in silvo pastures. What happens is the shade of the tree slows them down, slows the growth of the grass down. And, and that gives us an opportunity to graze our open fields in May and early June. And then when the soils dry up nice, we can move our animals to a silvo pasture. They'll have the same quality of forage they had three weeks ago in your open pasture, which is regrowing and recovering, and you're able to, to keep the system functioning. Um, the other thing silvo pastures do because they allow, they reduce the moisture stress of your forages and they allow them to, to stay in a more nutritious state longer is they help you meet that summer slump. So you see in this image, July is a, is a time when the amount needed by the animal, um, by the growing herd is more than the amount produced. And so in July, when you have this slump, you have this dry period, your silver pastures will typically have greener grass and an ability to provide your animals what they need while your other pastures are recovering. You can see that here. So this is an apple tree on my old farm, uh, which is very sandy soils. And uh, if you look under the tree where the shade affects the forages, you have lush green grass. When you get outside of the tree's canopy and shade influence, you have much drier grass that's not able to regrow as well. There's a couple of dynamics going on here. One is just that the shade of the tree is reducing the moisture stress on the grass which is allowing it to grow with less moisture in the ground because it's losing less to evaporation. The other thing that's going on here is the apples that fall on the ground and sometimes the animals that go under this tree um, add nitrogen to the soil and that nitrogen makes the plants more uh, efficient in their water use during photosynthesis. But having more nitrogen keeps it greener during periods of drought too. But it's really, in a lar large way, it's the shade here um, that's playing a big role on it because you can see the same dynamic in a silvo pasture that's more uniform. Um, you see, and actually, if you look in the center of this image in the back, you see two trees next to each other with this really dark green circle under them. And so this is just a really nice example of midsummer drought, green grass under the trees. And that's what that's what I point out here. So pasture production pat patterns, you know, there's a lot of talk about, oh, can we get warm seeding grasses in to help meet that summer slump of for forage availability? You know, these this warm season grass push, which I think is great and 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 works is a good idea for treeless pastures. Um, but another way of meeting that time of year's demand is to have silvo pasture. Because silvo pasture is going to provide you cool season grasses that are nutritious and growing during June and July. And here's, here's that, you know, just silvo pasture, midsummer, nice lush forages underneath. Um, so here's some work on forest conversion I was doing up in Northern New York. This is a hard thing to do. Um, but what, what I did was I took a hardwood forest, closed canopy, thinned it out to silvo pasture, to treeless pasture so I can compare it and then just thinned it without cattle for the first two years. And so here, um, this is four years later, on the right-hand side of this image is a silvo pasture that I'd seeded, I had grazed, um, it, it was forest, it had been thinned out and I grazed it about six days a year, three two-day stretches um, each summer. And the left-hand side is the same forest but it wasn't seeded and it wasn't grazed during the first two years. And that lack of grazing right after it was thinned allowed all of these shrubs and hardwood sprouts and other just volunteer plants to grow up and establish. 
Well, now this, and by this time of me taking this photo, I had started grazing that area on the left because the study was done. And it wasn't coming back to grasses because the, the woody plants and the blackberry and all of that had already taken up the space. And so those woody plants, they were established and it was their turf then. And for me to take that over, I would have to kill them somehow. And, and that's really hard to do. Um, so I guess the point here, if you're gonna convert a forest to a silvo pasture, you really have one opportunity to get forages to grow. And that opportunity is right after you thin out the trees. As soon as you do that, if you don't get forages established, you're going to be in a situation that's much more difficult and much more costly to get something established. Now, if you have goats, you may say, wow, that image to the left looks much better than the image to the right. And so that may be your goal with goats is to have an overstory canopy tree with more uh, woody brush underneath. And, and that can that can work. It's just you got to think about what your goals are. And I guess the point here is forage is really intentional in this conversion. You need to plan it and you need to think about what you want. Because if you just let nature make the decisions, they're not gonna be the decisions that work best for your animals. Um, and I, if you're trying to get grasses growing, I really suggest getting them planted first. So this is orchard grass during the first year after establishment and those forest conversions compared to no treatment on the right. And what happens is when you get something like orchard grass, a competitive forage in there, established is it doesn't wipe out all of the other forages or volunteer plants but it gets a foothold and then you graze it and it comes back and you graze it and it comes back whereas some of these other things like blackberry won't come back and on the right the cattle aren't going in and just eating a whole bunch of blackberry so it's just able to grow whereas on the left when cattle take a bite of orchard grass, they're bound to get a few blackberry leaves as well. And therefore that knocks it back and gives the orchard grass a competitive advantage. And that, that's really what you're going for in these systems um, is, is trying to get your grasses to have an advantage over your other plants. And here in Connecticut, um, we have a much bigger problem with invasive woody plants. And so the same concept, if you convert a forest to a silvo pasture and you don't get forages established right away, you have an open opportunity for Japanese barberry and multiflora rose and oriental bittersweet and all these other woody invasives that are going to be very difficult to get rid of um, when you try to then go back and establish forages. So give them that opportunity right away. I mean, one analogy I like to make with this is like, if, if you're planting a vegetable garden and you rototill it and then you are gonna go and plant your carrots. Yeah, you plant your carrots right after you rototill it. Because if you wait a month or two months and all the weeds come in and then you go just plant your carrots on top of that, guess what? They're not gonna make it and they're not gonna do well. Um, so you need to take that opportunity when you, when you have it. So um, that's my presentation. I, I think I have some time for questions and um, yeah, I'm happy to chat more about this. Let me open up the chat box. I actually don't have that open. All right, also um, at, the, at this point, we will open up, like Joe just said, we will open up for questions um, in response to his presentation. So. Um, certainly let me know or let Joe know, let any of us know who um, are on the line right now just by typing into the chat um, the questions that you do have. Um, and we'll give it a few minutes um, for you guys to get that done. Maybe when fo well, folks are thinking about their questions, I'll point out one thing that I didn't point out earlier on uh, establishing trees in a silvo pasture, planting them. Let me go back to my study here. Some things that we found worked really well um, were tree tubes, because not, not due to livestock, but due to deer. And so one thing I started to do for the cattle was I was wrapping um, 
electric poly wire around the tree tube because these are plastic so they're going to be a natural insulator anyway um, so i'd wrap the hot wire around that mesh tree tube like we weave it in a bit and that way when uh the cattle would go after the tree and tree tube they'd get a little zap on their nose and then they started to associate the tubes with electric fence and that worked to keep them off the young trees um keep them from rubbing on them or trying to chew those young trees um the other thing i did was I ran linear lines of poly wire along my young trees to keep the cattle away from it. So this this way they were able to graze between the rows, but um, but not destroy the trees. And and really I haven't had any problem with cows eating the trees. It's it's the white-tailed deer that are really the big issue. anybody has any questions, feel free to type them into the chat. Okay, Joe, I have a question. I'm not sure if you're seeing it. Um, one of our attendees is asking, can one over fertilize fields? Is there a worry and where does it fit into the rotational schedule? I figure one fertilizes just after taking animals off a field. Oh, no, I mean, you can totally over fertilize. Um, you, the only way to know to fertilize is to do a soil test. Um, so yeah, if somebody's going to fertilize their field, I mean, you, you could be just throwing money away or just throwing nitrogen or potassium into Long Island Sound. Um, so if you're going to fertilize, you really need to test your soil. And, um, I'm sure UConn has a setup for that. I, I sent a few of them out. Um, I just don't off the top of my head. I'm not sure, you know, where, but you all can chime in. But yeah, you got to test, do a soil test, and then fertilize. Um, I personally don't fertilize my pastures. Um, my pH is like six and a half, uh, so I have the pH tested. Um, I I would amend that with lime if it were too low, but I I just haven't needed to do that. And so if you just like add lime every year, you're eventually going to get it to a pH that's too high for your for your forages. Um, and if you're just adding nitrogen, adding nitrogen, then um, yeah, you, you could be in an issue. And, and so the other thing is if, if you do need nitrogen, you may have soils that are sandy and don't hold it well, or you just wanna get that extra boost. Um, you wanna add your, especially urea right before it rains. So your timing of your fertilizer should be uh, related to rain events too, and not just when you remove your cattle. But, um, but if you're rotationally grazing well, you really shouldn't have to add too much to your soil all that regularly. Your, your clovers and some of your natural nitrogen fixtures should take care of that. I know in the past I've shared where um, participants in our tri-state area, Connecticut, Mass, and Rhode Island can get soil tests um, performed, but I can certainly uh, share that information with you again, um, you all again moving forward through my monthly correspondence email, so I'll be sure to do that uh, coming up in the next month or so. Joe, I see another question coming in uh, from a participant asking, in discussing rotational grazing, you implied shifting fields on a weekly or so basis. Did I understand you correctly? And how many grazing spaces do you have and use in a year? Sure. Yeah, that's a great question. I see that there from Bill. Um, yeah, I mean, I I try to shoot for like a two to three day paddock size. Um, but, you know, if I'm if I have a busy week, I may go with a bigger paddock and uh, and have a seven day paddock, which is about the max I ever want to do during the growing season. I mean, right now, my cattle are, are in a, a sacrifice area where I'm doing a lot of damage to soil. Um, but it's a small area. It's intentional, you know, of like, I got to put them somewhere. If they're on my pasture right now, they're going to destroy it. So time of year matters. But during the grazing season, I like a, a two to three day paddock size. If I want to have them in an area longer, I give them a bigger area or an area with more forage. So I'm not, I'm not managing my paddocks, my paddock timing based on days. I'm managing my paddock timing based on forage availability. And I can change that forage availability by having it be a little bigger or a little smaller. Um, and I have about 18 cattle. And so I go with like an acre 
acre, acre and a half paddock size often. But I, even that, it depends because some fields are better producers than others. So really what I'm doing is I'm looking at how much forage is out there. Um, and I do that with my gut I, and just sort of my, my experience with my herd and what my animals will eat. Um, and then I check on them. So you can also do it with a grazing stick where you can actually go out and measure how much is out there and get an estimate. Um, another way, you know, like the way I learned it with my herd is uh, I just go based on when they're angry at me. So if I walk out to my field or I walk out my door and my cattle start to really yell at me, I know I'm a day late. So I always want to move them before they tell me I should be moving them. That's a good way for me to say like, okay, oops, I, I messed up a little bit on this one. I went too long or I pushed them too hard. Um, and sure enough, if they're moving at me, I go down there and, and they're definitely going to be grazing stuff below three inches. And so I, I want to get them out be, the day before or two days before they start yelling at me. Um, and what that, and it, it seems it's hard to do sometimes because sometimes you feel like you're moving them too quick um, and you're leaving a lot of forage behind. But what you're going to find is that leaving that forage behind um, it, it allows for a lot faster regrowth and a healthier pasture. The, the catch is you don't want to just put a small number of areas in a small number of animals in a big area and end up having them just eat the good stuff and leave the weeds that you don't want to grow. So you really need to make sure that they're somewhat uniformly grazing it. Um, before you move them on. And if you if they just won't do that or they can't do that, you may want to go and clip it after you graze it. But um, number of grazing spaces I use in a year, I probably have, oh, like 16 to 25 different paddocks. And I change these and I adjust them through the season too, because sometimes of the year um, I may need to use bigger paddocks and other times I will use smaller ones. So, um, yeah, that's why I like having this perimeter fence with poly wire in between so I can somewhat customize what I'm doing as I go through the season. Um, and I usually don't back graze. So some people will let them graze a paddock and then just open up the next paddock and they can still go back to the one they were just in. I really like to avoid that because what they'll do is they'll go back to the one they were just in and stay in concentration areas or eat the good stuff that's starting to grow back. So I'm really a big fan of closing off a paddock before you move them on to the next one. Um, but there's, there's exceptions to that that can work well. Like if you, it's like a two day thing where you put them in a big paddock for the first day, they have half of it. The second day they have both halves of it and then you move them on. You know, you can do things like that. Joe, there's uh, one last question that maybe we'll, we'll take. It's in regards to goats. Um, do you have any recommendations on the number of goats per square foot or acre of pasture? We have very small operation, but want to be sure not to overgraze. Currently, we keep them in the same level unwooded pasture year round. We're looking to move them up the hill uh, where there are trees and brush, lots of barberry, and uh, the flat field where they currently live. Yeah, um, I can't give like a per acre per stocking rate, because it depends on what forage is available. Like if, I mean, barberry is pretty toxic to animals and like it'll do, it'll do bad things to your goats and won't give them much nutrition. So like if your forest is just all barberry, your stocking rate is zero goats per acre. Um, you need to do something to get something other than barberry in there for them to eat. Um, so, so I can't, I can't really give you that. What I, what I can say is see what they're eating and how much of it there is and, um, and then try to get your, your stocking rates. I mean, definitely having them in one area all year round is not good for your trees. It's not good for your goats. Um, so yeah, I, I would start by breaking it up into paddocks and, uh, but really if there's a lot of shrubs that they're not going to eat, I think, um, you want to you want to try to give them something uh, for goats. I suggest anybody raising goats and trying to graze them under a forest canopy. Check out Peter Smolage's goats in the woods study because it was pretty eye opening that goats can't just survive on woody browse in that's grown in shade. Woody browse that's grown in full sun is much more nutritious 
um, as, as, you know, assuming it's not toxic plants like barberry and some of these other plants. But um, woody browse grown in full sun is much more nutritious for goats than woody browse grown under a forest. The stuff grown under a forest, it does not give them enough nutrition to live on or, or to thrive on at least. Um, yeah, so I'm, I, I can't answer that question specifically, but I will say it sounds like you need to do some real active paddock sizing and development and then some active removal of some shrubs to get some better plants in there. Because goats don't just want woody brush, they want forbs and they want other plants that are non-woody as well. I guess on a ballpark, I guess I should give a ballpark. You know, if I had, like, if I were, I grew up raising goats and sheep, so I'm not totally a cow person, although I like cows a lot better. Um, but yeah, so if I were raising goats in Connecticut in a silvopasture system with like dispersed trees, I would probably want like at least a half an acre per goat, maybe, maybe even an acre per goat for those. Yeah, half an acre per goat for the whole season. Probably do it, um, depending on if you're milking them or not, you know. But but not like leave them in the half acre the whole season. You know, they, they'd be moved regularly and that area would be allowed to regrow. Yeah, it's, it, it's different with woody brush because woody brush doesn't respond the same way grasses and forage and forbs do, uh, legumes do to grazing, you know, grasses are adapted to that, where they're adapted to have their leaves eat and then regrow and then eat and then regrow. And eat. Whereas woody plants, they don't want to do that. They want to grow their leaves and they want to hold them for the whole season. So if you have them grow their leaves and then you consume those leaves and then they regrow them and you consume them, you're eventually going to kill that plant. Um, so it's a little different with woody stuff because with woody stuff, you especially with goats, you may want to just partially graze it and then let it grow the rest of the season. So you almost need more space in that system than you would with like a grass system. Joe, another question coming in is um, back to, in reference to the barberry, can you clear something like um, barberry or I'm assuming any other toxic type plant out using pigs? Um, uh, to like, graze the area out and then feed it for the next season for cattle, go cattle, goats, or sheep? Yeah, that's a great question. You can. The problem with something like barberry, it's like the nastiest of the nasty, right? I mean, I have 80 acres of it up here at our farm that I'm working on getting rid of. So, you know, I'm very sympathetic to this. And if people have a quick solution, I'm open. Um, I mean, obviously, uh, glyphosate can work, but that a lot of people don't want to use. Um, using pigs to, to just knock an area down, it can work. You're, you got to recognize that by doing that, you're going to do damage to your soil. So barberry, multiflora rose, bittersweet. I mean, these plants are the toughest of the tough. They're there, especially barberry. They're there because of people leaving animals in the woods and the animals eat everything but the barberry and then the barberry thrives. Um, so if you're trying to use pigs to knock that stuff back, the way pigs are doing it, because they're not consuming it, is the way they're going to do that is they're going to they're going to destroy the soil to a condition that the barberry can't survive. That that's how you would do it. You get the pigs to root that soil so much that the barberry can no longer survive. So essentially, what you're doing is you're you're doing so much damage to the soil that the toughest of the tough woody plants die, and your trees in that system. They're also going to die from that, but they're going to die a lot slower because they're a bigger organism with a lot more reserves. So they're going to live off of their carbohydrate reserves for maybe 10, 15 years even before they completely succumb to that amount of damage. So your trees are actually more sensitive to it than your barberry and are going to die from this much more directly, but you're not, you're going to see it at a longer amount of time. So yeah, you can use pigs to, ra to raise an area, you know, if you really want to just knock stuff out, but recognize that wherever you do that, all the plants are gonna die. Um, and it's probably gonna do a lot of damage to your soil. So what, what I've had good success with with barberry and this winter was terrible for it because we didn't get a freeze up, 
but um, is putting a round bale out. And you can do this with pigs too, especially if you can get a good alfalfa haylage bale. Um, pigs love alfalfa round bales. And take a round bale, for, I do it with my cattle. Take a round bale when the soil's dry or frozen and put it right on top of that barberry. Just smother it. The animals are gonna eat it. They're gonna knock that hay down. They're gonna waste some of it. But what they're gonna do is they're gonna smother that barberry. And it's gonna have a, a tougher time coming back. And that may, after you knock it down, maybe a time when you can go back and clip it again two or three times during the course of the summer. So that's, I call them round bale bombs. Um, I really like using those. And my strategy for cattle up here to deal with barberry is to, in the winter when the ground's frozen, I'm, I'm stressing that because when the ground's frozen, they won't damage your tree roots as long as you don't totally smother the tree roots. Drop a round bale on whatever shrub you don't like and uh, and let your animals eat it and knock it down. And then in, go back the next season and seed it with some, some good orchard grass or, or annual rye and let that stuff establish and then start to compete with your barberry. You're still gonna have to go back and clip those woody shrubs but they're not gonna be as thick and they're gonna be much more accessible and visible to you. But by letting pigs or cattle or whatever, or goats just go in and, and trash it, you're gonna, you're gonna do more damage to the soil. And goats don't work all that well for clearing brush because they nibble, they don't really destroy. Um, and so goats will nibble it, but they're not really gonna kill it. So one, one way I've dealt with brush in the animals for a long time is, um, just like putting cows in first, letting them scratch, letting them knock things over, doing it when soils are dry or frozen so I don't hurt my trees, and then um, and then going in and, and getting rid of what I need to through clipping. Because once you put the animals in, then you can at least get through the stuff to see what's going on. So, so there's a long, long answer. Another uh, question I see coming through, Joe, is what is the life cycle of sheep parasites and how should it inform my efforts to rotational graze? Sure. Well, I'm not the expert on this, but I can give you some, some insight on it. Um, the big ones that sheep, and so if someone else uh, wants to chime in and feel free, but the big ones of sheep parasites, at least, especially I guess in Connecticut, would be barber pole worm that I'd be afraid of and some other, mm -hmm. some other gastrointestinal parasites. Um, so, cause there's, there's other things out there too, like liver flukes and things like that. I mean, cattle, I, I had liver flukes and some cows I bought one time, um, that came from wet pastures. So like with those, those are liver flukes come from snails. They have a, a alternate host of snails. So if you have your animals on wet pasture in the summer, they're going to consume those flukes and they're going to mess with their livers. So like the solution there is don't leave your animals on wet pasture all the time. But with sheep uh, and barber pole worm, uh, I can speak to you. Um, the, the life cycle of it is that it's going to be ingested. It's going to be pat. The eggs are going to be passed out the sheep in in the form of manure, and then those eggs are going to stay on the surface of the pasture, mostly at the at the lower bare soil level. Um, and then the sheep will go and they'll consume them. They'll either eat them by getting some, ingesting some of them, or they'll breathe them in. So the lower your grasses are with your sheep, the more likely that those sheep are gonna breathe in some soil particles or consume some soil particles, which will have some of those parasite worms on them. So the way to deal with that is to try to keep your sheep from grazing things too low. Graze them at a higher level. Um, another thing I've, I've heard of people do is multi-species grazing for, the, for this type of parasite where you run your sheep through and then after the sheep go through, you run your cattle through and they actually will consume a lot of those eggs, which uh, don't affect the cattle. And so the, the parasites, you know, they, they don't live out their life cycle in a different species. Um, so that's, that's, that's more of a complex system, but... Um, in terms of just keeping your animals, especially sheep, healthy on pasture, don't let them graze it too low. I mean, three, four inches, move them. And then don't let them be um, back until that grass has grown back up. But some of those parasites are tough and some of them are very pesticide resistant now too. Um, so, yeah. Okay, 
yeah. multi-species grazing if you have a big problem maybe maybe a good bet Thanks, Joe. Um, I think at the moment, I haven't seen any other questions come through. So um, certainly uh, we seem to be heading right on time through our agenda. So maybe if there is anybody who has further questions, certainly again, feel free to get in contact with me um, after the webinar today and I can make sure we get them answered for you guys. Um, Joe, I guess, is there anything else you wanted to mention before we um, stop for a quick break and, and switch gears to Justine? Um, no, that's all. Thanks, everyone. I, I do need to step off because I'm teaching, even though it's online, I got to prep my classes today. Um, but yeah, thanks everyone for joining. Thanks for inviting me on this. I'm happy to do, if folks are interested in, in civil pasture, you know, I'm happy to keep collaborating. Um, with Rachel and, and other other folks in Connecticut on uh, on making civil pasture happen because I think it's a good thing but there's a lot that we all need to need to learn about it I mean I'm learning new things about it all the time so um, yeah reach out if you want to chat more or if there's there's certain things you want to uh, you want to know about that either either I can take on as research or we can just chat or you know learn farmer to farmer. Great. Well, thank you very much, Joe, for joining us today, and I'm sure uh, we'll be in contact again as, as the project continues. Great. Awesome. Thank you. All right, everybody. So um, I had uh, Mackenzie post up the evaluation link again for um, today's webinar. So if you haven't um, gone ahead and posted or posted, sorry about that. If you haven't gone ahead and answered those pre-evaluation questions, if you could actually head over to the chat box now and click on that um, link that is posted to Slido. Uh, once the new uh, page comes up, enter the uh, passcode or access code SARE, S-A-R-E, all cap letters, um, and go ahead and answer those for pre uh webinar questions. Obviously, we've gone through one presentation, but you can answer it um, as your knowledge prior to uh, Joe's presentation today. Uh, we're going to take a quick break and uh, probably convene back here in about five minutes or so, and we'll get started with uh, Justine's presentation um, on the rest of the other grazing systems that we commonly see in our area. All right, folks. Well, hopefully most of you are back with us and we gave you a long enough um, break to, to get some other things off the list or use the bathroom or grab a drink, but um, Justine, Dr. Justine Deming from the University of Rhode Island is going to get started. I'm going to pass it over to her. She's our last presenter today. After she presents, we'll again do a Q&A section and um, uh, allow for any other group discussion if, if anybody has any other questions or, or input. And then from there, we'll wrap up today with our post evaluation questions. So, with that, uh, Justine, I turn it over to you. Hi, hey, thanks so much, Rachel. Um, and thank you again for having me. Um, I'm, despite the circumstances, I'm, I'm happy to be um, speaking with everybody. And I think I might have met a couple people this past summer. Uh, we did a, an in person workshop over um, at Windmist Farm um, near Newport, and that was a a really fun time and I've enjoyed collaborating with you guys and getting to know you guys and everything about this organization a little bit more. So um, I hope to continue to learn from you guys as well. Um, every time that we have met, I've, I've learned something new. So, um, so like Rachel said, I'm gonna talk about um, the different types of grazing systems. Um, Joe did a good job uh, kind of introducing some of it. Hold on, my slides are not advancing. There we go. Okay, so um, I'll just go through um, an outline of what I'm going to talk about today. So just a little bit of an introduction. Um, then we'll go through the different components of grazing systems, um, the grazing system options, kind of figuring out which one is the right one for you. There is not really a one size fits all for every farmer and, um, you know, in every uh, location of where you are. Um, then we'll go into the pros and cons of each of the systems, um, a bit about the management of each of these systems, um, and then a bit of summary. So 
like Rachel mentioned, um, my background is primarily with dairy cattle. Um, uh, but having spent four years in Ireland for my PhD, I have gotten to be more interested in grazing um, and grass based systems. Um, of course, when everybody thinks Ireland, of course, you think green. Um, so they, they would be some of the world leaders in grass based farming. Um, so I, I was fortunate to learn a lot from the people there um, and made some great connections there. So if I keep referring back to Ireland for a certain um, uh, examples, I apologize, but that that is, um, I think we can learn a lot from systems, maybe outside the US that are doing a lot more intensive grazing systems um, than we uh, than we usually see here. So I'll continue on here. All right, so grass based farming in general. Um, uh, of course, everybody that is listening to this today and involved um, in this project is probably a grass enthusiast, so I'm preaching to the choir here. Um, but on, on farms in general, and especially dairy farms, but this goes for other farms as well, um, feed costs account for the vast majority of costs on farm. Um, and this is closely followed by labor. Um, and so anything that we can do to try to reduce those feed costs um, and then potentially labor costs as well, um, is obviously going to have knock-on effects for the profitability of the farm. Um, and this is where we've seen um, in different, uh, different countries, um, especially in Ireland, New Zealand, um, parts of Australia, places that do a lot of grass-based farming um, and, and focus all of their efforts about the animal harvesting their own feed. Um, they have been able to kind of wrangle this profitability by having perhaps more of a low input system um, in terms of uh, you know, machinery and, and costs and infrastructure. Um, and oftentimes you do result in lower outputs, which I think should be noted as well. You can't expect animals that are going to be on just grass to be producing the same kind of outputs, whether that's dairy or meat, um, as an animal that would be more conventionally fed with maybe a total mixed ration, more grains involved. Um, but the, the flip side of that is that when you do have this product that, um, you know, has been grass raised or primarily on grass for most of their life, you've, it's lower cost input system. Um, the potential for the product value is increased coming out of that. So at, we've probably all been to the grocery store um, or even maybe your local farmer markets or what have you. Anytime that you see grass based or grass um, on a label or some kind of, of advertising, we almost always see an increase in, in price of the product. Um, and, and that's partially due because the, the farmers has, they're not getting as much of an output. So they have to increase the price of their product um, in order to get back some of that, um, those costs involved, um, even though it is generally a lower cost, uh, a lower input system. Um, so, of course, anytime we see this, we usually see if, if someone is using grass or a grass based system, you, you should see it highlighted um, on their marketing. It's a very clever tool um, and it does work. And then you'll, you'll usually see the, the prices increase as well. But normally things will be marketed with green on the product, um, on the packaging, and then they'll almost always be mentioning um, if grass um, was involved, especially because consumers are kind of seem to be moving in that direction that um, there's more of a a focus being put on what is natural for animals. And of course, grass is very natural for ruminant animals. Um, so when we talk about a grazing system, it is truly a system because it's not only the grass that we're looking at, of course, or just the animals. And I did put animals at the bottom of my list here for a reason. Um, whenever I talk to people about grass-based farming, um, a lot of people, when you think farmer, you think the animals that go with the farm. Um, and I think, Maybe this is just my crazy way because I'm, I'm a grass enthusiast, but I think people need to rejig what they think of farming as you're not, um, you know, a dairy farmer, you're not a, a sheep farmer, um, you're not uh, a beef farmer. <clears throat> if you're using a grass based system, you are a grass farmer and you're using the animals um, as a tool to manage your grass. Um, and so that that kind of concept is going to be. Um, maybe focused a bit more, uh, the more intense the, the grazing system, which I'll go through. Um, but regardless of what system is, is being used by, by individual farms, um, 
all, kind of all of these components are going to play a role. So whether that's um, a fairly laid back approach or if it's a fairly intensive approach, you kind of do have to think about all these different things. So I'm going to go through um, all of these different things a little bit in a little bit more detail, um, starting with infrastructure. So kind of the probably one of the biggest things that we think when we think infrastructure is going to be a barn. Um, you know, do you have a full barn? Is there an actual barn that um, animals are going to be coming back to? Not all farms uh, necessarily need a barn, uh, just especially depending on what type of system you're running. If it's maybe a stalker operation where you don't actually hold animals over the winter. Um, in this, uh, this scenario here on the right, um, this farm does winter some animals and that would be um, kind of a big bedded pack barn that they have uh, for the animals in the winter. Um, this is at Peckham Farm at URI, where I work. Um, we do have a full a full barn. We have a hoop barn back here in the back of the picture where um, all of our sheep do go in the winter, but um, during the warmer months, they are out grazing every day and they do not come back into the barn. Uh, we do have a couple lean-tos and three-sided barns um, throughout different areas of um, kind of the yard here down near the barn. Um, our animals have to come back to this area to get water. Um, but they also then have access to shade. So I've taken this this summer. It was about 80 degrees. Um, the sheep were not having it. They just looked for any kind of shade that they could find. So there's actually about, um, I don't know, probably 15 sheep huddled up under here just trying to get out of the sun. Um, so in other scenarios, the, um, a simple windbreak might be all that you need, especially if you are having animals um, over the winter, and I'll get into different types of animals and maybe what they need, because um, uh, it does vary a little bit per type of animal. Um, but sometimes just a simple windbreak is enough, um, or in this scenario, the shade, um, to have some kind of shade. Um, I was really glad that Joe, obviously, he was talking about trees, um, but in a lot of scenarios when you have, um, you know, you have a, a big field perhaps, and then it's surrounded by trees on the edges, um, Sometimes people will just use that as, okay, well, my animals can go over there for shade. Um, and I think Joe brought up a good point that, you know, the animals can be really, you can damage soil um, if it's an area that is a high traffic area. So especially in the summer, like in the 70 degree heat, um, animals are going to be seeking out shade. And so if you had an area along the fence line um, that was very shaded because of a tree line that was just up along the edge of the field, um, you can expect over time, if that's an area where animals are constantly able to go for relief uh, from the sun and from the heat, that you would start to see of the soil health and the potential negative impacts that it would have on the trees. So um, I've, I've talked to people on kind of on different sides of the fence, excuse the pun, of this, um, this debate, but overall it seems that if you want to keep your trees there, then you kind of need to protect the trees and keep the animals away from that. Um, but that's just my opinion. Um, another thing that if you do have animals over the winter, um, you're likely going to be, or hopefully you'll be taking them off of uh, the paddocks or the, the grazing lot for, for the winter. Um, again, this is in the summer in that top right hand corner, uh, but that would be an exercise lot, a lot where they can be outside of the barn should they choose. And then the bottom picture here, I just took yesterday actually at a barn or a farm um, not far from where my parents live in North Stonington. And, um, and you can't really see it here, but there's a, a little feed wagon here. So um, these are just the heifers for this dairy farm um, that they're out in the winter, but they're, they're not, they don't have access to the whole farm to, to graze, which is a good thing because we, we want to preserve the, the grazing um, area and we don't want to trample that over over the winter. So it's not uncommon to have some kind of exercise or some um, a lot where you know that it's going to get damaged and we're bringing feed to them this time of year because obviously they're not going out and foraging um, and grazing for themselves. Um, another big one are laneways. Um, and this can be as simple or as fancy as people want to make it. Um, this was a research farm where I did my PhD in Ireland. Um, this is um, you know, this this cost a bit of money to put this type of laneway in. Um, it has so many positive effects for this whole um, grazing system. Um, this comes into play a little bit more when you've got a dairy um, 
when you've got a dairy facility where you've got animals that have to go back into the barn twice a day. So there's going to be a lot of foot traffic going back and forth. Um, if you didn't have a designated areas of the pasture are going to be damaged. Um, and so then when we talk about how much space animals need and measuring grass, um, if that if those areas of grass are damaged, that is not something that you can use to kind of estimate how much forage is on that pasture for those animals. So having designated laneways <clears throat> where you know you're sacrificing the they're going to grow there and that's fine, um, but it does save the pastures. Um, okay, entrances to paddocks, um, having, having multiple entrances to paddocks can be beneficial, especially if perhaps maybe you've got, um, you know, if you're a watering system, if you don't um, have the ability to move it, um, then you're going to have areas that are going to get trampled over and over again, but it kind of goes with the same with the entrances to paddocks. If you have multiple entrances to paddocks, um, you're reducing the amount of wear and tear of animals constantly going over the same area. Um, fencing, um, Joe touched on fencing a bit as well. Um, and again, we'll, we'll get into this as you kind of increase the, um, the how, how concentrated the, the management is for the, the type of system. You're going to probably have more fencing <clears throat> to do as, as it gets a little bit more intense. Um, but I think strip wire and electric fence is a godsend, especially in terms of grazing. Um, it just, it's so, it, it just makes so much sense. It's easy to move um, once you can have, um, you know, more long term fencing in as well, but having the ability to move fencing is going to be um, really crucial, especially if you're looking to do a more intensive grazing system. Um, and then water availability is another one that um, can be a bit of an issue um, in some places. <clears throat> Excuse me, I mentioned at URI at our farm, um, we don't have pipe that is um, dug deep enough below the frost line that it won't freeze and burst over the over the winter. So um, we actually have to have our animals come back to our barn um, in order for them to get water. Um, it's not the, an ideal scenario, um, but it is it, it actually does allow them to come back at least and get a bit of shelter from the sun when they're out um, if they should choose to do that. Um, but we do have designated laneways for the sheep um, and the cattle. It's the same scenario with the cattle. Um, that, you know, if we know that we, we don't have water sources out in the pastures, uh, we don't have a massive farm, so maybe it's not a, a, a huge deal, but the animals do have to come back down for water. Um, this is another, actually, this is the same farm as the one above. It's um, a great farm out near Newport, uh, but they've got, um, they keep this water line, um, you know, mowed down so that the farmer can easily find where the water um, source is coming from. Um, and they've got quick attach or quick release um, uh, water attachments so that they can move this little, um, well, this little portable water fountain, basically. They can move that, not only can they move it from pasture to pasture, but they can move it um, to different spots within each pasture each time that they go through um, so that they're not creating that, that trampled area, that area that's getting too much, um, too much traffic on it. So um, lots of different, uh, ways to do water. I attended a conference up in New Hampshire last month. Um, there was a whole a whole session on water. Um, so I think water in the winter is probably the bigger issue for a lot of people. Um, a lot of farms, at least that I know around here, bring animals indoors during the winter and maybe don't leave them out. Um, leaving them out that you, I mean, you, again, you could have an entire conversation about how to do water in the winter. Um, but um, yeah, it's just uh, water is definitely something to, to take into consideration. So when you're choosing um, a grazing location, I've got an aerial map here that we got taken um, of Peckham Farm at URI um, this past summer. So in the red box here, we've got, um, I just highlighted where our current barns are. So in, in our scenario, we've got um, the barns here and our, we call a grazing platform or the, the grazing platform, I'm not sure people are familiar with that word, it might be an Irish term, um, but the platform is the, the, graze, the grazing area that's immediately around and accessible to the barn, um, an area that the animals are actually grazing on. So, uh, so here we use, we use this area, this whole area is our grazing. We've got the sheep come up in, in here and our cows use this area over 
over here. Um, and then the rest of the fields that you can see in the in the photo there we use for hay production and then a little bit of research um, fields as well. So um, something to consider if if people are trying to decide, okay, well, where is this grazing location going to occur? Um, you know, if there is a barn, if you want animals to have access to the barn, that's probably one of the primary things to think about. Um, then we need to consider, well, how much land actually is available and is it in close proximity to the barn? Um, especially again, in a dairy scenario, this is probably more relevant, but will animals have to cross the road to get from one paddock to the next or back to the barn? Um, so in a non-dairy scenario, it might not be so important that the animals get back to the barn every day or, every, or you know, even twice a day. Um, but it is something to consider that do animals need to cross the road? Um, is it is it a busy road? Is it safe to be crossing animals to cross the road or to get to the next paddock? Um, and that can also be an issue with, with the water availability as well. Um, so will you allocate some of this land um, to winter feed? So hay production um, or will it all be grazed? Um, that's another thing to consider. Um, is the land in a protected area or is it near wetlands? Um, there's different rules, um, I believe, uh, people that um, have connections with the NRCS probably could point you in the right direction on this, but I know that there is, um, there's some rules around having farming near wetlands, um, keeping animals uh, out of waterways is another thing. Um, so is it, are they going to be having access to water through a hose, a well, a pond, a stream? Um, Oftentimes, if they are having access to a stream that can create problems. Um, so I do believe that the someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure that the NRCS does have plans and there's help out there to try to help people keep animals fenced away from streams in order to um, try to keep that water a little bit cleaner. Um, and so then we also need to consider are these areas um, on the farm, are, are there some that are more suited to grazing as opposed to hay production? So anybody that's ever done any hay production would know that obviously there's fields that are um, suitable to doing hay and, so, and some fields that are not. Um, of course, we've got a lot of rocky land in New England um, and some fields, if, if the rocks are not picked out of those fields, it's literally just impossible to actually hay those types of fields or, or, or pastures, um, in which case you would probably designate those to be um, grazed rather than hay production. Um, so. As farmers, we need to be thinking forward, of course, into the winter months since we cannot graze animals year round in this area of the um, of the country. Um, you know, how are we going to get that winter feed? And um, do you want to designate certain areas just to hay production, or do you want to, um, you know, cross back and forth between grazing or hay production? Um, but those kind of decisions need to be made. But it, a lot of it can come down to what is the topography of that area on the farm. Um, and then also in New England around here, um, you know, we've got lots of stone walls. Can you even get haying equipment into some of these fields is another issue. Um, I really need to be able to, to break down walls to, to even be able to get in there. Um, okay, so soil fertility. Um, I'm no soil expert, um, but I do know that soil is very important. Um, soil without proper soil, we will not be able to grow good grass. Um, and super easy to be able to take samples and send them away. I think I already saw a link was shared um, from Mackenzie there that, that you can get samples um, done at UConn. I've historically gotten things done through UMass. Um, really cheap, you, the simple, I get my students to go out and do the soil samples as an exercise, but our farm manager appreciates it. Um, and so then we can then make management decisions based on what we get back from our soil sample results. Um, one of the big things is figuring out what the pH of the soil is and then making uh, decisions from there um, <clears throat> on whether we need to lime, fertilize, um, spread manure um, as necessary. So um, that getting the soil right um, is crucial to growing good grass. And sometimes you may have some fields that will start out well um, and then over the course of the season or maybe the course over of, of a couple seasons or, or grazing seasons, um, you know, we'll start to see a bit of reduced production. Um, and, you know, maybe the weather was actually quite similar, but what is the only difference? Well, the difference is that we're, we're, take, we're constantly taking nutrients out of the soil and not necessarily putting anything back in. Um, so soil, I can't stress this enough to, to take care of the soil and to 
actually take um, soil tests and, and get those results back um, with whoever you did your soil test through. They can help guide you on um, the recommendations and recommended practices to do um, given your results. So definitely work on that. Um, again, kind of going with soil fertility is that we know um, anyone that's gone out and walked anywhere, um, you know, on, onto the sidewalk, you notice that it's oftentimes not grass that'll grow up, nice uh, grasses that we want that'll grow up in the middle of the sidewalk. It'll be the most annoying weeds, oftentimes dandelions, different types of weeds, you know, will grow up in what seems to be like there could be nothing there. So we'll see like the top picture that I have here, we'll, we'll see weeds growing out of literally cement or the sides of a stone wall. And you're like, where are they even getting this nutrients from? Um, that kind of, that concept, knowing that weeds do not need much to grow is a concept that should be carried over into grazing systems. So as that quality of the field deteriorates, which over time, oftentimes the pH will start to lower and it'll become more acidic. Um, weeds like those conditions, they've adapted to be able to withstand the worst scenarios possible. So just naturally by the soil pH and the, the nutrients in the soil adjusting, those conditions are going to be favorable to the weeds over the desired plant species, which are, um, you know, our timothies, our orchard grass, things that have a higher nutrient value than the weeds. Um, last summer, I just picked some of the weeds that were coming up um, in our own fields. Um, just had the students do a bit of weed identification. Um, but it, it is good to know and take note of what it is that is growing in the fields, because that can give you an indication of what's going on with the field if you haven't already done a soil test. Um, so a little bit on plant varieties. Um, I think it's always helpful to go through and walk the pasture and become acquainted with what is in the pasture. Um, I make my students do a um, kind of a, a, a field guide, if you will, of they have to do, they have to collect samples of what they're finding in our fields and the surrounding areas, just so they can kind of get an eye for figuring out, um, being able to identify what are desirable plant species, what are not desirable plant species. Um, and that's a practice that I think any farmer could do on their own farm, pick up some things, we press them, dry them, and then put them in a folder. Um, and then you can flip back to that and, um, and you know, identify what you have or what you don't have. Um, but you want to be able to identify what grasses, uh, legumes, and weeds are occurring in that field naturally. Um, and that can give you an indication of, um, you know, what, what really wants to grow in that area. Um, so on those soil test results, um, they will give you, you know, usually the type of soil that you have. And there's lots of different types of soil. Um, you probably have already have an idea of what the drainage is in the pasture, um, but that can give you an idea of what would grow or what would not grow there well. Um, and, and try to, if you're going to be receiving, make those decisions based off of, well, what do I want in this field and what, what grows here naturally and what is, what are the, you know, what kind of plants are going to thrive in the type of soil that I have. Um, I've got, he, oh, up in the top here, I've got a picture of Timothy grass. Timothy is a little bit finicky. Um, it, it needs kind of specific growing conditions for it to really thrive. Um, whereas on the right here, some of you might recognize that it's something that we don't generally want, um, reeds canary grass. It really prefers very wet areas. Now grazed at the appropriate time, um, it can be a, a very good forage if it's grazed early. Um, and it can be something that can withstand a really wet field, which is something that Timothy probably wouldn't do well in. Um, so then we talk about, well, <clears throat> when we talk about plant varieties, of course, you're gonna have to talk about weeds as well. And Joe touched on weeds a bit with the, um, the, the woody varieties. Um, but just in a regular pasture as well, things can take over, bad, <laughs> bad plants or the weeds can take over very quickly. And um, I talked to a friend of mine who actually works for a chemical company and, and I asked him to come in and, and talk to one of my classes about, you know, what can we do for weed management and, you know, what chemicals should we be using to get rid of weeds? And even as, a chemical salesman, he says that the best tool for weed management is a thick stand of grass. Okay, we're gonna sh we're gonna shade out um, and take up the space in the in the pasture with grasses that we want, and so we want to try to optimize those conditions as much as we can 
to make those conditions an area where the grasses and legumes that we want are going to actually take over and the weeds are going to be pushed out. Um, <clears throat> so I'm also a big fan of grass measurement and I was really excited that Joe kind of touched on, um, you know, follow not not necessarily following a particular pattern of like days that animals can stay in a field um, or pasture, but you kind of have to be looking at the grass and how much grass is there. And so that comes down to grass measurement. Um, ideally, it should be done every week, um, maybe even more in the spring season, depending on um, how fast things are growing. You might be able to every other week um, in really slow seasons, but um, taking note of the grass and how it's growing is vital to keeping the quality right. And so I'll go through um, in, in the next couple slides, I'll talk a little bit about why we care about um, grass, uh, grass measurement so much, but um, there are different ways of measuring grass. Um, probably one of the most scientific methods is what we call the cut and weigh method. Um, this is widely used um, in Ireland, especially in, in under research settings um, where you're basically taking um, cuts throughout your paddock, um, you're weighing those, doing a dry matter, and then extrapolating from that one little section or a couple sections that you might have taken how much grass is actually on the paddock at any given time for uh, that's available for grazing. Um, another common tool is to use a falling plate meter. Um, this is a bit less labor intensive than the cut and weigh method. Um, you literally just need to be walking through the pasture, um, and then as you're making drops with the plate meter, um, it's measuring uh, density and, and how much grass is actually there. Um, people are probably walking through their fields anyway, especially if they're doing a more intensive rotational system, they're gonna be moving uh, strip wire and, and what have you. So um, really kind of user-friendly tool. Um, another tool that is awesome and, and I think very straightforward and you can get a lot of information, it's, um, a really inexpensive tool. It's the, the grazing stick, uh, which has a lot of different information on it. Um, this past summer during the, the pasture walk, we used that a little bit and the cut and weigh method, um, both totally acceptable methods. Um, the pasture stick is probably one of the most inexpensive out of the whole, the whole group of things. Um, and then once people have figured out how to gauge their eye from actually measuring grass, and it does take time to do this, you know, it can take a year, it can take a couple seasons um, to act, to be able to gauge with the eye actually on the field at any given time or, or how much feed is available to the animals. Um, but the grass measurement, it's, it's so important because knowing how much grass is on the field that's available for grazing um, will indicate to us and will allow us to make management decisions about when should I graze this? When should I let it rest? When has it gotten too far and I need to harvest it mechanically? Um, so one of my favorite little sayings is if you're not measuring it, you're not managing it. Um, and I, I love data, so I love keeping track of stuff like this. It might not be for everybody, but um, if you're measuring it and, and keeping an eye on it in some way, it's better than nothing. Um, but this is definitely going to be necessary as people move to more a more intense rotational system to really get the most bang for their buck out of um, the labor involved that's uh, a little bit more labor intensive once you get more intense. So, um, so part of the reason why we, that grass measurement is important and um, there's a lot of information about there, out there about when to graze, when to mechanically harvest, when to let it rest, um, but it all kind of comes back to this chart here, which is showing us the, the phases of plant maturity. Okay, so in the very beginning when the plant is just growing or, or maybe it was just, yeah, it's, it's basically just beginning to grow here. Um, lignin, which is an important part that keeps the, the plant kind of structurally sound. So if you think about it, the, the older it gets, the more it needs to be able to stand up tall and withstand wind or what have you so it doesn't actually blow over. That's going to be lignin. So lignin it gives it, gives it structural um, ability to go up. Okay, and then when it's very young, it's very palatable, it's delicious for whatever animal is going to be grazing it. When it's that delicious, there's very little lignin because it's not super tall. So what if you were to look at the beginning of a plant, it's pretty much all leaves. And in the leaves is where we have all of the protein um, and you know a lot of the, the sugars and 
the things that we're that we're looking for for an animal to get you know nutrients out of the plant so it's the most delicious when it's the youngest um, we don't want the animals to have access to it at this point because if we let them have it when it's the most delicious and most nutritious um, it's actually going to kill the plant okay so that it needs to um, have grown up enough so that it can actually withstand grazing um, but as it gets older so as it gets older and uh, and more mature that nutrient level is going to eventually start to decrease while it gets taller so this whole area where we want the animals to be eating is kind of in this happy medium in between we don't want to be grazing way out here um, because it's not as palatable okay so palatability and nutrient content decreases as the as the plant gets older and if you think about it you, you know you've got this older taller plant it's stiff nobody wants to eat that um, and it actually doesn't have much feed value at that point either um, so i've got a couple of pictures here so this is an orchard grass um, again when it's very young it's just starting out here here it's kind of midway and kind of in that middle perfect grazing um, age and then here it's done it's headed out so the seed head is here it's visible it's very tall okay it's almost waist high on this person um, and then eventually it's going to die off and just be, you know, brown. So we can think about this while we're looking at this. And this is pretty much exactly how it goes for um, orchard grass in particular here. So this looks delicious and soft, but we don't actually want the animals grazing it right then. We want to be grazing here when it's in this middle phase here. Okay, once we get out here, um, it's too late. I would prefer to not graze animals when it's this high or if even when it's dead. When we're out here, we're going to be looking to mechanically harvest. Okay, so as a management tool, that needs to be taken care of. We don't want to just be putting animals out here just to get rid of it. We really should step in and mow it down to an appropriate height and let it start to regrow and then put animals out on it when it's back to this kind of ideal length here. So I took a video this summer and we did a run through the other day and we couldn't really hear what I'm saying. So I'm just going to show you uh, the video and then I can kind of talk you through what we were doing. Um, but basically the animals had just been on that paddock before we had just moved them into here. As you can see, it's way too tall. Um, so this is, you know, they had way more feed there than they could probably handle and which is what it looked like when they initially went in here. So you can see what they didn't eat. This is orchard grass here. Um, is this tall ligniny tough? Uh, you know, it's not palatable. It was it was too mature at the time, so it's as tall as my boot. The animals left it. Um, they ate off the tops, um, but they they left this whole area down here. Um, and so all of that could have been forage that was used had we grazed it earlier. Um, so ideally, you want to graze it before it gets to this stage so that we don't waste it. Um, I think in this video here, um, basically just walking through that we want to have a look after animals go through and graze a field. It's really beneficial as a producer to go back in when you've moved them and have a quick look to see what it was that the animals didn't touch because they will be picky um, and they do have preferences. And these, this is, um, a bluegrass species, and they do like that stuff, but they didn't like it at that stage of maturity. Um, we have a bit of velvet grass, which is technically considered a weed, but our cows actually like it. Um, but you'll notice that we don't actually have a lot of weeds in that field. Um, so we are lucky in that sense because we do have a lot of grass. Um, but I think if we had put animals in there earlier, um, we would have gotten better utilization out of that paddock. Um, so then if we talk about animals, um, we need to match the species and the breed and number of animals to the grass available on the farm. Um, so, especially with some hobby farms, people have different preferences, maybe of what they want to be growing. Um, I love Belties here. We've got Belties versus Herefords. Okay, to most people, these are both just cows. Okay, they're both beef cows. Not much of a difference. Um, in reality, this breed of cow is actually a double coated breed. Okay, they do not have much fat on their bodies um, and probably the highland cows would be similarly um, like this. They produce a very lean meat. 
um, but they were designed to have their coat keep them warm as opposed to putting on body fat like our Herefords do. So keeping that in mind, um, especially in hot weather, um, this type of animal would probably need more access to shade than a Hereford. Okay, they keeping that in mind for matching the species to whatever type of fields or pastures that you have. Um, do you have access to, you know, sunbreak? Um, these guys are very good in the bad elements. So these guys can do really well without needing a full structured barn, you know, in inclement weather because they, of where they were, where they're coming from, they're designed to be able to handle that. Um, whereas other breeds maybe can't handle that quite as well. So that's definitely something to look into when we're looking for, um, you know, even just within breed. <clears throat> Um, multi-species grazing. Um, it's a pity that um, the other speaker couldn't get here because there's a lot of really inter interesting um, information regarding multi-species grazing, but they're, you know, figuring out what combination of multi-species grazing is going to work for your particular farm. Um, and it does come back to that infrastructure with, the, with um, fencing as well, because um, anybody who's tried to fence in sheep or goats versus cattle know that you probably need a little bit different type of of, um, of fencing or keeping it lower, um, sometimes even different, um, you know, voltages uh, to keep different types of animals in. So um, that's something to consider. But multi-species grazing can be amazing. Uh, and Joe mentioned this before in terms of, um, you know, parasite control, um, but also sometimes you'll have some species that will prefer certain types of grasses and weeds and legumes over others. Um, and then maybe having cows go through first and then sheep following or vice versa, um, or even if you had goats, they can really work as a group to truly graze that pasture down um, because they just prefer different types of plants or different stages of plant maturity. So that's something to keep in, in mind as well. Um, we also should consider the animal's stage of production uh, with, with the needs um, of the grass availability. So. If you look at systems like Ireland and New Zealand, um, and again, parts of Australia, they have based their entire production system around when the grass is peak, when the, when the grass is peaking. So especially in a dairy system, when the calorie needs are so high um, for a lactating animal that you need, if, especially if you don't wanna spend extra money on you know, feeding them extra food just so that they can survive and, and produce, you want to time their stage of production so that peak lactation, you want that to coincide with peak spring grass production. So they those countries have successfully done that and that they are um, you know they're they're producing really high quality large volumes of grass when the animals are going to need that the most for their stage of production. Um, so and some species have done that just evolutionarily. If you look at sheep and goats that are seasonal breeders, you know, they, they breed in the fall so that they lay them out or, or kid in the spring. Um, and that evolutionarily, they have timed it so that they know that there's going to be grass available in the spring. So when they're going to be lactating um, and feeding young. So it does make sense, but it is something to keep in mind, um, especially if you're pressed for the amount of feed that you have. Okay, so all of that, sorry, that was long-winded, but now how to choose a grazing system. So uh, before I talk about the grazing systems, I just wanna to touch on a couple more things. Um, so we have to talk about stocking rate um, and stocking density. So stocking rate is how much livestock a farm can accommodate given the pasture availability. So that's kind of on a year to year basis, you know, how, how many animals can, um, how many animals can we grow on this many acres of land? So that's kind of something that's not changing day to day. It's more of like an overarching stocking rate. Um, stocking density, on the other hand, that is something that changes um, it changes a lot depending on what the current conditions are. Um, so stocking density is described in the concentration of animals on a given pasture at a specific time. So, and I'll talk about this in, in terms of grazing system in a moment, but <clears throat> despite whatever system that you're looking at, um, producers need to look at decreasing the stocking density, basically putting, um, the same number of animals on more on more land or taking animals off land to reduce the pressure on that land. So 
We want to decrease the stocking density if it's poor pasture quality. So if we go through a season um, that's very droughty, so the, the the regular amount of you know your regular paddock that you normally can hold animals on for X amount of days or whatever, um, just because of the drought, it's not actually growing. So you actually would need to increase the amount of space that the animals have access to in order for them to meet their caloric needs. So um, we would be decreasing stock stocking density and increasing the amount of area that the animals have to, to graze on. Um, if animals are not going to be pastured in a rotational system, then stocking density needs to be low. Um, if you've got stony or ledgy hillside soils, so soil erosion is a big problem in this kind of um, land, and we want to try to maintain soil integrity as much as we possibly can, which means taking care of that soil. So if it, we know that it's stony and ledgy, um, the last thing we want to do is to be overwhelming that pasture or that particular area um, with a lot of animals that are going to inevitably trample it and, you know, increase the rates of um, uh, erosion uh, more so than it, it normally even would be. Um, if regrowth is slow, so that could be um, a number of reasons. Maybe we grazed it down too low. Um, the, the previous time, again, maybe there was a drought, um, you know, some kind of damage to the soil, what have you. Regrowth is slow. We want to basically make sure that we don't overload that pasture again. Um, or if we've got low rainfall or excessively, or if it's excessively drained again, kind of goes back to the drought stuff. Um, so then alternatively, we can increase stocking density or put more pressure on that particular paddock or increase the amount of animals that are on a particular space. If we've got great pasture quality, um, again, in the spring, we're going to see a flush. I can't wait for it. In the next couple of months, we're going to see that boom, that super flush of spring grass. Um, where you've got grass coming out of your ears and you don't know what to do with it, throw more animals onto a concentrated area of grass and get them to actually graze it down. Um, if we're rotating several pastures, we can increase stocking density if it's well fertilized uh, with low erosion, um, or if animals are giving supplemental feed. So um, again, coming back to the dairy, but if oftentimes people will feed a little bit of concentrate, even on, um, or grain, um, even in a grass-based system back at the dairy, at the parlor, maybe to entice animals to come back to the parlor or just to give them a little bit of boost of um, calories in a different in a different way. Um, if they are being fed supplemental feed, then um, there is potential that that you could increase the stocking density a bit because they're getting other feed elsewhere. Um, so the they should be able to um, being a little bit more competitive in the pasture is okay. Um, and avoid animals that are avoiding species that you would rather um, them to eat. I've got a, a couple of videos, hopefully it, it comes through um, that you can see that, but putting pressure on the animals, um, <clears throat> basically putting them in closer quarters with each other where they don't have a lot of options, where kind of, you know, what, what we're giving you is what you get. And not that I'm saying that I want people to be, um, you know, forcing or, or encouraging their animals to eat weeds, but um, the more that we can get rid of those weeds and encourage grass growth, then we're going to shade out the stuff that we don't want. Um, so choosing a grazing system. Um, okay, there's two major types of grazing system, kind of uh, especially in the US, but also even in just New England, I suppose, um, and in different, different areas of the world. But the biggest one and the most popular one is probably what we would consider continuous grazing. Um, and I'll go into that in a minute. Then another like a subdivision of continuous grazing would be one step that's a little bit more managed, um, and we would consider that to be improved continuous grazing. And then the other um, major type of system would be a rotational or controlled grazing type of system. And then you could take that one one step further um, and really, really increase the intensity. Um, and that one would be known as management intensive grazing, or sometimes you might see that written as MIG. Um, and again, I just want to stress here that the, the choice in system is completely dependent on the farmer's desire to manage grass. Okay, so if you do not like grass, if you're an animal person and you don't care about grass, maybe a rotational system isn't going to be for that person. Um, they really have to be in tune and interested and motivated to manage grass properly if they want to, you know, kind of go down this flow chart uh, with the MIG being the most intense system. So I talked about stocking density before and increasing animals um, on a particular space. So I think this just gives a nice 
little visual. Um, again, we've got the continuous grazing on the left, which would be that very popular um, in the US. We think of the rangelands out west. Um, basically, we're not rotating animals at all. Um, they've got a lot of space between them. So there's tons of land mass <clears throat> per animal. Okay, then we get into a basic rotation uh, where we're subdividing the land a little bit. We're, we're closing the animals in a bit more. We're going to force them to eat a little bit more efficiently. Um, and then on this system, on the this would be the intensive or management intensive rotational system, we're really pushing the animals to you know, be competitive and eat the grass in a very efficient manner in a very small space and then moving them on. So you'll notice here that we've these dashed lines, it's fencing in order to keep animals off of the rest of the area because that resting period is crucial to making this work. Okay, so I just wanna note again that there's increased management skills and infrastructure necessary the further down the intensity line that you go. Um, now, I'll, with that, um, the potential for increased quality and quantity of outputs is also increased the more intense that it gets. So the farmer can get way more bang for their buck if they're doing an intense or even basic rotation more so than the continuous rotation. So there you will get more herbage mass out of uh, more herbage mass and more pounds of animal flesh or, or dairy or whatever you're looking at out of this type of system than this system. Um, but it does come with the amount of management. So if you if you want those improvements, you have to be able to be on board with increased management skills as well. So the continuous grazing system it is the most common grazing system in the U.S. Uh, when we look at you know how the vast majority of beef is produced in the U.S., everybody thinks, or I don't know, I think a, a common conception is that we've got animals that are in feedlots, and that's you know they are born there, they grow there, and then they are finished there. Well, that's not really how it happens. Um, out west, the vast majority of animals are out on a rangeland for a good portion of their life, and then they're moved to um, feedlots. But in this particular scenario, stocking densities have to be kept low in order for this type of system to work. Um, so there is a risk of management mistakes um, being minimized. So, um, you know, you basically you only need to make a couple decisions with this type of system. Um, when to put animals out in the beginning of the year and when to take them off. Okay, so those management decisions are, you know, two two major decisions versus you know making those decisions every single day um, is in a more intense scenario is a bit different. Um, so if we looked at actually the amount of grass being taken off um, per acre on a daily basis, it's actually quite small in this system. So we're not really pushing the land. Um, the same way that we would in, in an intense scenario. So um, those average daily rates of removal are quite low. Um, now, the animals have access to this entire the entire acreage. So the whole area of the farm um, they have access to. So you can assume that there's gonna be a bit of uh, repercussions in terms of uh, grass availability or plant availability as a result of that. So. Uh, continuous grazing is super popular for a reason. It's quite low cost. Um, you don't need a whole lot of inf infrastructure. Uh, from a labor point of view, you don't really need much labor as animals are not being moved every day or every other day. Um, so the, the, those are definitely attractive features to continuous grazing. Um, some of the disadvantages though, um, we're gonna have low outputs, okay? So that's low levels of inputs in this system, but we're also going to expect low levels of outputs. Um, the grass that they're going to be eating might not be as high quality or as nutritious as on a more intense rotational system. So the likelihood of needing to finish animals on grain if you're producing meat animals um, is a real um, possibility or kind of a real reality, I suppose, um, with a continuous grazing system, which is inevitably going to cost more money in the long run. Um, we also know that it will result in more less desirable plant species. Um, this, if you remember this picture was uh, from the very beginning when um, we're looking at a plant that's just starting to grow, okay? They're, they're going to eat that if they have the opportunity. So <laughs> we're, we're never fencing anything off so that they can't go back and we can't protect those plants. So that, that's going to be a problem where the, the cows or the sheep or whatever you're, you're grazing, they're going to have up the opportunity to go back and 
as soon as the delicious plant is starting to grow again, they can kill it. Um, and so then once we're killing out these grasses that we want, the undesirable species are able to go to seed. And that's exactly what we don't want because now they're able to go to seed, they're going to prop, uh, proliferate and take over the field uh, very quickly, which is not what we want. Um, and so while a lot of weeds are edible, um, they are considered weeds because they just have a lower nutrient profile as opposed to the species that we've identified as species that we want. So um, while you know they do have some substance to them, it's just that on a pound per pound basis, our animals are gonna get more out of the plants that we've um, identified as ones that we want. Um, so this continuous grazing is popular in the Northeast um, as well. So this is a field that it's not completely enclosed. They can get out here as well. Um, I'm sure some of you recognize this um, bush here, but this is multiflora rose that has taken over pretty quickly. And this field was just overrun with lots of different types of weeds um, because they never were <clears throat> forcing animals to um, you know, eat down just the grass that they wanted. And, um, and the, basically the, the, the weeds that they didn't want were starting to take over. So unfortunately um, that will probably continue there um, unless those are taken out. So um, a couple more disadvantages with continuous grazing, you might be getting a sense for which type of systems I prefer. Um, but when we look at disturbed areas, so usually areas that are going to be affected by drought, certain pastures are going to be able to handle um, drier conditions than other, others, or if we've got um, overgrazing going on, it will not heal even if we take the stocking rates down, okay? Because the animals, we can't have a pep talk with the animals and tell them, look, you really need to give this section a break. <laughs> um, unless we force that on them and actually put up a fence line, you have to just accept that that's going to happen. Um, so the risk of damaging plants under um, drought position, drought conditions um, is possible. So the best thing that we can do is to slightly move away from the continuous grazing system and go to improved continuous um, where you're basically creating some kind of even slight rotation so that we're giving that area a break. Um, and if it's not possible um, to switch individual pastures, uh, pastures um, you can try to seasonally rotate them at least. So, um, you know, some seasons maybe you would have allow one area to be dormant and vice versa. So even if you have any opportunity to um, move animals, then that'll help reduce the, the pressures of that. Um, so then we have improved continuous. Um, this is slightly more structured than the tra traditional continuous and that it does give us a lot, um, a bit of a rest period. Um, there are advantages that it's still fairly low key in terms of labor. Um, it is a little bit more intense than traditional continuous in that we are going to get better grass utilization, mostly because we're going to be allowing uh, the grass a time to recover. Um, and so that will allow a little bit of regrowth. Um, disadvantages with improved continuous is that we still will run into the same problems that we do with continuous. So when we've got improved continuous would still be low, low stocking density. So if you can see here, we've got this band of cows here and they have this entire field. So because of that, you're going to get patches like this where they've eaten down everything that they, does, that they thought was tasty and they're leaving the plants that they didn't want. And then those are the ones that are going to seed head. So that will continue to be a problem with this. Um, uh, with this type of system. Um, and another disadvantage with even improved continuous is that again, should something happen, you know, whether we've got a drought or flooding or um, it's very dependent on what the conditions are of the pastures, um, we don't really have many options because maybe we only have two spots. So they stay here for half the season and then they move over to this side for the other half. Um, so it's just, it's kind of, um, you know, cornering, cornering yourself and not giving yourself many options should there be some kind of a negative scenario. So then we move on to basic rotational grazing, which I'd say is probably pretty popular or getting more popular um, in the Northeast. Um, this is allowing animals to graze a paddock for several days before moving to the new area. Um, and we want, again, the important part is allowing grass to rest. Um, and that usually, depending on the time of year, can be about 30 days until we put animals back on that pasture, but that does depend on the regrowth. Um, so how that system is managed 
does influence the amount of production that we're going to get. Um, and so you need to be evaluating the nutritional needs of your animals. So again, that comes back to looking to see stage of production. Um, you know, are they a growing steer? Are they a lactating animal? Are they a, a yearling? Um, and then assess the forage quality and the amount that you have, which comes back down to measuring grass um, and then regulating an appropriate amount of acreage for those animals to access at the right time of the plant's maturity. So there's, you can see already things are getting a little bit more intense when we do basic rotations. Um, this is our sheep over at URI. Uh, we do basic rotational grazing um, here. See they're efficiently moving through that pasture. They're motivated to eat. Hopefully the video is coming through. Um, but the, those sheep are moving quickly. They had just been turned into that pasture and they were motivated to eat. You can see the grass wasn't very, very tall. Um, it was it was a good, a perfect time for us to, to move them in there. Um, so with rotational grazing, we've got lots of advantages. Um, we know that we can increase pounds of animal production per acre. This has been shown again and again in different studies. Um, it can improve pasture quality, mostly because, again, that if, how can we get rid of weeds? A thick stand of grass. And so if we're forcing animals to eat things down in a more tightly, air, tightly um, enclosed area, they're going to have to um, eat down some of those weeds inevitably as well. And then hopefully the grasses will come back as a result. Um, another thing is that we can actually, um, it requires less land area than continuous grazing to get the same kind of outputs. Um, so that is, again, is something that's important, I think, for New England farmers is that if you wanted to increase the amount of you know, meat produced or dairy produced on a per acre basis, um, we are kind of strapped for land around here. We're not the great wide open ranges that the, that the West has. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, also, in terms of animal welfare and um, just monitoring your animals, they are more closely um, monitored in this type of system when you're going to actually be seeing them every day or maybe every other day. Um, I've got a video of our, our sheep here. They're very friendly, but they're used to students and used to seeing us nearly every day um, to, to come attend to them in the summer. Um, so, so there are uh, definitely disadvantages to rotational grazing as well. Like I mentioned, it's probably going to be in terms of increased management. Um, so you're going to have to be doing some kind of grass measurement and tracking the grass, water access, um, more fencing, labor to move the fencing. So I think fencing and water and labor are probably some of the biggest things that people need to be able to do in order to make rotations work. And um, I've talked to farmers locally in the area who would love to do rotational grazing, but they're like, I just... I don't have the labor to do it. I've got five other things going on. This is a part-time job for me. Um, you know, I know all of the positives to doing rotational grazing, but I just can't implement it on my farm because I don't have the labor um, to be moving fronts and moving water. <clears throat> so um, it does come down to a personal, personal level. Um, and with more fencing, of course, you've got the opportunity for animals to escape as well. So hopefully, <laughs> hopefully the, this group will be able to do that fencing um, workshop in the summers. Um, I would love to kind of learn a bit more myself about fencing um, through that. So I'm not sure if this video is through, but um, this is our beef cows where we, again, the stocking density is very low in this, but it is a basic rotational system. Um, but you can see that this, cow, um, well, all these cows were, were eating down the pieces that they liked and they left weeds and they left areas um, that maybe had dung on them that, where they didn't want to eat them. Um, and so now they've kind of overgrazed certain parts of the field while we were hoping that maybe they would eat some of the areas that were still perfectly fine, but they weren't touching. So a bit of an experiment with this, but um, and moral of the story is I think we had too much acre for the amount of animals that we had on that pasture. So that would help if we had pushed them in a little bit more of an intense situation. Um, another video here we've got um, a young heifer where she's kind of lackadaisically walking around the pasture, taking a nibble of this, a nibble of that. She's, the, the grass is very high. It's at the seeded out stage um, or the headed out stage. And, you know, she's trampling as she's walking through. She's not efficiently eating down leafy grass, which is what we want her to be doing. She's maybe searching for the leaves at the base um, and just kind of she doesn't look like a motivated animal that's that's trying to efficiently pasture. Okay, so 
and uh, that kind of leads me to our final step, which is the management intensive grazing uh, or the MIG. Um, this is a video from where I did my PhD. The, you can see the, the girls are headed out to um, the next paddock that they're being allowed to after milking. Um, and if you can, hopefully the clarity comes through on, on your end as well, but you can see the color differences in the grass from what was just grazed, what's growing back um, and where they're headed to. Uh, but the color is is quite striking. Hopefully the, the detail comes through, but you can also see them utilizing those laneways um, that they've got. And of course, this is a research farm, so it's set up fairly well, but there's water troughs in every single paddock, um, which is super helpful. So this management um, intensive rotational system, um, it is the same premise as a rotational. It's just that it's intensified management. Um, again, it comes back to the grazing and resting of several pastures in a certain sequence. Um, and again, it needs to be going by where the grass is, not necessarily that I, I, I know people get in the habit of going, well, I like to graze in this line, I graze here, and then I go to the next one, and then I go to the next one. Um, the most difficult thing that I think I've ever tried to have people uh, do in terms of changing a type of system is to break that habit of I go in a particular rotation. You need to go where the grass is in that prime um, in that prime box. When we think back to the plant maturity, we want them eating wherever that grass is. That's where we want them going. We don't want to just stay stuck to a certain sequence. You might have a, a, a pasture that is, you know, more well drained than others. So, you know, in a droughty scenario, your grass is going to not grow very fast there. So let it rest, let it grow back and bring them over to a pasture that maybe wasn't as well drained and is growing really well. So getting out of that habit, I think is gonna be important. Um, okay, so it's not uncommon that when people go to this management intensive, yes, it is more intensely managed. You're going to have animals that are maybe only staying in that paddock, uh, very, like, potentially a, um, a high stocking density for maybe only 12 hours, okay? And especially on a dairy system, um, like in Ireland and New Zealand, they're only going to keep them on there for a certain number of hours before they take them off for milking. And then when they come back from milking, they're let out into a new pasture, uh, which is very different from <clears throat> even basic rotations where you might have animals staying in there for two to three days. Um, so this is, again, it's just increasing that intensity. Um, but with this, we know that we can pretty much double the amount of forage that is grown on this type of system. Again, if it's managed properly and if we're not overgrazing either because that can be a problem as well. So I've got another video. This is um, the Irish cows. You can see that they're very motivated to eat it. With every step, they're taking more and more mouthfuls of grass, which is a pretty stark difference from the Herefords that I just showed a minute ago that were kind of lackadaisically walking around through the paddock. So these cows are motivated. They've got pressure on them in order that they know they've only got a certain amount of time in that paddock before they're going to um, run out of grass basically. So they're kind of in a bit of competition with each other. Um, you can see here that, that is the ne that's the end of the paddock right there. Okay, so you can see the light in the, the right hand corner um, just next to that. Um, you know, that, that's very close. So they're, they're pretty tight on here and they only got a couple hours to do so. I've got another video there. So Joe showed this before um, as well, just talking about the effects of the grazing system on the plant. So it kind of brings to light to see what's going on in the root um, and what's going on on top of the ground. So if we've got the continuous grazing, um, you know, we're constantly grazing those tasty plants down um, and not allowing them to, to rest. Um, and as a result, the roots are going to be quite a bit more shallow and you don't see the same kind of regrowth happening. Um, you can also kind of screw this up with even basic rotations as well if you don't allow for a long enough recovery period. Okay, so allowing that plant to, to fully recover from a grazing interval and then them putting them back on. So um, I guess on the far left where we've got the um, a short intense grazing period um, and a long recovery is going to be the most optimal scenario in order to, uh, to keep our grass going well and getting the most out of it. Um, okay, so strip grazing, that is part of rotational and intensive rotational grazing. So basically you're gonna put a strip wire up um, and basically keep animals into that specific section, force them to eat that down until um, whatever your desired, what we call residual or the, the grass that's left over um, 
before moving them on. Okay, so when things are grazed down well, you should see a very clear visual there um, of where they've been um, and where they're going. So this would be a very kind of basic um, rotation. And again, this is a visual that is just showing the, the concept, not necessarily. We're going to assume that in the, the, uh, the, the way that it's progressing here is that the grass just happened to be at just the right height as it went forward. But again, you might have to be a little bit um, more lenient about, you know, going in particular orders. You have to go where the grass is actually growing. But just showing, you know, we graze here in week one. This is all resting. The next week, okay, this area is ready for grazing. And we're going to back fence. So Joe did mention um, that he does do back fencing, which means that you're you're putting that strip wire up or you're keeping that same strip wire there to not allow animals back into this area before you are ready for them to graze again. And that is again to preserve the visual that I just showed you of preserving the roots and making sure that that plant has an opportunity to rest because the cows or whoever it is that's grazing, they have their favorite species and they will overgraze given the opportunity. Um, and then moving forward and then they would come back down here if it was ready to be grazed again. And so this farm as well does have a laneway. So if you didn't have water at every single grazing point, um, pretend that they had a you know a barn down in the, the bottom that they had to get water at, you would utilize that um, that laneway so that they were not having to go back through the area that is supposed to be resting. Um, so it would be simple to just throw up another line there to force them to go back down a particular laneway that you you know that they're going to destroy, but it's not going to compromise the rest of the resting area. So a couple of ways, that, uh, visuals of how people sometimes set up different rotational grazing systems, um, kind of the more traditional on the right here, where you've got, um, you know, maybe one water, or maybe they've got water throughout, um, and then they've got equally sized paddocks um, that they can move animals to in a laneway so that we don't um, destroy, again, any of the, the other stuff. And um, this other one in the, the top left is kind of the spokes of a wheel where we've got um, a water water access in the center. Um, and then also this could potentially be a shade area as well. I know farms that have done that, that put shade there. Um, and then having variable size fields. So um, again, you're gonna have to decide by measuring the grass and knowing how much your animals need to eat. Um, do I need to maybe make some of these pastures a little bit bigger or a little bit smaller depending on uh, grass availability? <clears throat> um, but that I think is an interesting system as well. Um, so some considerations for rotational and intensive grazing. Um, there's a lot of advantages. Um, it reduces the need for supplemental feed, which is expensive. Um, it improves the, the forage composition. It's going to improve waste distribution. So that animal waste is excellent to put back into the, the soil. Um, but if we can make it more evenly distributed, that's going to be optimal. Um, we're going to actually minimize daily fluctuations of intake and quality feed. So Joe touched on that as well, that when you've got animals that can just willy nilly graze whatever they want, you don't really know what they're eating. You don't know the quality of what they're eating. And, and for a ruminant, they like consistency. Um, the rumen microbes need consistency to, and to have a, a healthy rumen and then a healthy animal. So when you're doing an, uh, even a basic rotation, you're monitoring and you can you know what the animals are eating and hopefully it's going to be consistent. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's easy to, um, to um, allocate different pastures um, to the animals depending on what their um, nutritional needs are at the time. So again, the drawbacks are mostly management. Um, if not managed correctly, then it really can be a problem for the plants and it, it can spiral downhill very quickly um, and we can really ruin pastures with rotational grazing or the management intensive grazing if people don't understand the forage growth cycles and the need for that rest period. Um, this can also be a problem when we have a higher stocking density, which is what happens on the rotational systems, is that we're going to end up having more soil compaction um, just because you have more animals on the land. So making sure that we're not overdoing it with the, the paddocks, um, that's going to be important as well. Um, and then again, more infrastructure as well. So basically the basic and intensive rotations mean more in management decisions. So I've just got a couple of slides here um, about considerations. And I'm focusing on the rotational systems because um, there are a lot more 
management factors that we have to consider when we go this route. Um, so following a grazing plan is important when you're doing a rotational system. Uh, there are different tools online that you can find to set up a rotation, a rotation calendar. Um, you can post it on the side of the barn. You can have it on your phone. There's lots of different tools out there for coming up with a visual way and to track which animals have been in what fields and making sure that you're allowing that rest time. Um, again, stress can be high on these paddocks if not managed correctly. And I did put a picture of a horse here on purpose um, because certain types of animals eat differently. Um, horses are known for being really rough on pastures because they have the opportunity with their teeth. Ruminants don't have teeth on the upper part of their mouth in the, in the front, so they're not nipping grass down to the very the crown or to where the, the grass comes out of the grass. Okay, horses have the opportunity to do that, and that is very damaging if we don't, even in a rotational, you can do a rotational system with horses, but just making very sure to take animals off as soon as there's going to be too much pressure um, on the grass. And so Joe mentioned a three to four inch residual post grazing height, which is what I also recommend. Um, that's a great height to, you know, it's just, it's just a good height to get a clean grazing off of the field, um, but to also allow for regrowth for the, for the next height. So don't worry too much about the numbers on these graphs. I'm just, um, last summer I did a bit of data collection on our own farm um, at URI. And so I went through and I labeled all of the different fields that we had and we, because of a housing and water scenario, we unfortunately cannot do uh, multiple species. So we have our cow fields, we have our, our, our cow pastures, and then we have sheep pastures. Um, so I'm just gonna focus on pastures here for a minute. So um, there's different parameters when you are doing grass measurement that are indicators of when, at, at how many kilos of dry matter per hectare at, at certain height or certain amounts of that forage, when to graze, when to mechanically harvest, or when to let it rest. And so the the <clears throat> kind of the rule of thumb, especially from um, Irish literature, is that you graze at 14 to 1600 kilos of dry matter per hectare. So when you have that amount of forage on your paddock at a given time, <clears throat> excuse me, that means that you have that your plants are at that growth stage. If you remember back to the plant maturity, they are at that middle stage, that prime stage for grazing. So 1400 kilos of dry matter per hectare, that is a mature enough plant to be grazed and it's still palatable and it's still nutritious. It's not super stemmy and yucky. If we get up to 2,500 kilos of dry matter per hectare and higher, that's when we're looking at really ligniny, tough, headed out, maybe, you know, even dying kind of herbage mass there. So that is like, definitely we should be mechanically harvesting if it gets up to that 2,500 uh, mark. So uh, this green line here is just showing when we wanna graze. So farms can go through and very simply, I just did this in Excel, but you could, you can go through and track, okay, this paddock has this much grass, this paddock has that much grass, jot, jot, jot it down. And then you can create a visual to see, okay, this makes sense. I need to graze cow 2A right now because it's at the perfect height for um, for grazing and it's going to be palatable. At 2,500, I need to mechanically harvest. So those two fields at that point should be harvested with a tractor. Um, okay, so then a week later, uh, we had grazed that. Um, and this again is in May. So I think it's just important to note that this is May, this, the bump in the spring there. Um, if you looked at Cow 2C, the week prior, it was at 2,500 kilos of dry matter per hectare, which was, you know, that's tall grass, that's headed out grass. Within one week in the spring, that herbage mass had doubled up to 5,000 kilos of dry matter per hectare. That field, I can't even tell you how much grass was on that. I was swimming in grass in that field we, because we didn't have a chance to harvest it. Um, other things were going on, the tractor was busy, so we couldn't actually harvest it then and it just blew out of proportion. So I think that's a nice visual to show if you are measuring grass, you can keep track of that um, and really see how fast things are growing um, in particular points of the time of, of uh, the season or not growing. Um, okay, so how long can your animals stay in a particular paddock? So again, with increased uh, intensity comes more management and a little bit more math. 
the first thing you need to do is determine your animal's needs. Okay, so on average, we usually feed about 3% of body weight, 2 to 3% body weight of drugs, depending on the animal's status. So, again, just using our farm as an example, we had for our cows, um, we had three, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We had 11 animals <coughs> that were all at different stages of production. So, we had calibrated, okay, you know, they weigh roughly this much because I think in metric, because I've been abroad for so long, um, I do, I think in but you could look at this in pounds as well. But when we look at a percent of body weight, which is what you do um, to figure out how much your animals need, then you can figure out, okay, I need 150 kilos of dry matter per day for my 11 animals. Um, so then when I looked back at the information that we had from the previous slide, um, I just want to is in a per hectare basis. Okay, so that 1400 or 2500. That means, um, you know, harvest now that's on a per hectare basis, but not all of our paddocks was 1 hectare. So I did divide that information down to the size of the paddock. So then we knew exactly how much grass was on those um, on each paddock. And then you can decide how long your animals should stay in that paddock. So we needed 151 per day. And then if we looked here, okay, my animals need 151 per day. If I put them in cow 2 a which I knew was at that 1400 kg of dry matter per day, which is optimal, you know, palatability and nutrition. Um, they can stay in there for about two and a half days. Okay. If you just doubled 151, they've got about 400 in there. So they could stay in there for about two days before I needed to move them on. Um, so that's, or I'm sorry, I guess I was looking at cow 2C here. Um, so that, that's how you can kind of get an idea for using the data that you've collected and making proper management decisions and making sure that you move them on and when it's time as well. Um, a couple other things, um, drainage. So I've talked about this a bit before, but most farms know which fields drain or don't drain. Um, there, and Joe talked about this a little bit as well, but there is a high probability of animals ruining fields if they are let out onto pastures that are too wet. So they're going to completely ruin the root structure um, It'll get waterlogged. Um, poaching is kind of a fancy name for um, what they do with their hooves and then kill the grass there, uh, retains water. So um, trying to avoid that as much as possible. So if you did have a scenario where you had animals that you wanted to go out into a pasture like this or a pasture like this, and um, you know it's the, the height of the grazing season, the animals should be out. Well, this is when a management decision when you should actually take them off and put them in a different field or pasture or <clears throat> take them back into the barn and then feed them supplemental feed because it's really not worth it just for the sake of keeping animals out on pasture. It's really not worth it because it's going to take way too long for that paddock to, um, to bounce back from that. Um, I mentioned this before the excess spring growth. Um, so we do get that big bump of grass in the spring where you just literally cannot keep up with the number of animals in, in certain paddocks to try to make sure that they're grazing it down. Um, it shouldn't be wasted, so it shouldn't just be left to grow and then, um, you know, just let it be. That should be saved for winter feed. Um, so what we do when we've got a bump of, of summer growth or spring growth, we'll go through and um, either allow the field to get to a point where we'll just hay it, or you can do what they call topping, where even after the animals go through and graze it, if they didn't graze it down to the residual that you wanted, um, you can go through and mow it down to that three inches. And there's an opportunity, if there was enough there, then you could bail it if, if you, there really was enough. But another option is to just um, mow it down and then just let it sit there and let that be organic matter that'll go back into the soil. And I think Joe um, mentioned that as well, that it's you know going through and mowing it and letting those nutrients go back into the soil is, is actually very beneficial um, as well. Um, protecting the grass. So I talked about um, the importance of laneways um, and um, and back fencing. Basically, just ways that we can protect um, that that regrowth stage because that is so important in any grazing system. But especially when you have the opportunity to have more fencing, like in a rotational system, to back fence so that um, you just create a sacrificial area where you know it's going to get trodden um, and and go from there. So I suppose um, that was kind of my long-winded version of, of talking about continuous and 
rotational grazing systems, um, you know, there's definitely benefits and drawbacks to each system. And like I said, it's not a one size fits all. Um, it's especially going to be dependent on the level of management that the um, that the farmer is willing to put in. You know, what kind of resources are available to them, um, and and can the property that you've got or, or have access to, um, you know, the system needs to make sense for the layout of the property as well. Um, so I suppose uh, with that, I will take any questions. All right, all, anybody who has questions, certainly feel free to type it into the chat, uh, just like uh, we did with Joe's presentation. Um, I haven't seen anything yet, so feel free to um, enter those now. Justine, one just... <clears throat> Sorry, one just came in. Can you further discuss some considerations for placement and planning of laneways? Sure. Um, <clears throat> again, I think it it depends on the layout of the the farm in particular. But um, just for the benefit of the farmer and ease of labor, I know a lot of people will try to put laneways where it makes the most sense for them to be moving waters as well. Um, that can be one option um, for us, we just try to take, at least on the farm at URI, we just tried to, we took the, the shortest route possible pretty much. We just made one laneway up the center of um, all of the paddocks. Um, I think we had, we've got 10 or, 10 or 15 paddocks now that that laneway all um, accesses, but it, I, I don't think it makes a huge difference where you put it. I, if, if you've got an area that makes the most sense for, um, a route back to the barn. Um, I would just put it there. But if it's if it's going through, you know, a really great stretch of land, then maybe that wouldn't be the best option. Um, you know, if you had an opportunity to, if it, if you could take a route that maybe was more rocky or you know an area that the grass didn't grow so well, that, then that might be um, kind of a a way that would make more sense to to put the laneway. But for us anyway, we just. Because all of our land was kind of created equal, we just kind of ran the laneway up the middle so that it made it easiest for us. Great, thanks, Justine. Um, I'm just waiting to see if we have any other questions come through. While we're waiting on that too, I will mention that um, I am going to, again, this was recorded, so I will again put up the, the recording onto our project website uh, at the, by the end of this week, in addition to the presentations from both of our speakers today as well. Uh, here's another one coming in, uh, Justine. Do, uh, do you have a good reference for identifying weeds in grass that you'd like to share? Yes, um, I can send, um, I should have put a picture in, that in there. Rachel, I'll send you the book, uh, the title and the, um, the authors, but I believe it's called Weeds of the Northeast. Um, it's kind of the Bible that I go by. Um, it, it, puts, it kind of labels everything as a weed because technically a weed is just something that somebody doesn't want and a plant that we want maybe a turf grass owner would not want, but for us, it's it's actually a plant that we want uh, or a forage. Um, so it, it is called Weeds of the Northeast, but um, it's got all, pretty much all the forages in this region that we would ever come into uh, in, uh, that you'd find and the weeds as well. And I, I think it's super user-friendly. I'm refer referencing it all the time when I'm out identifying things, um, but it's got great descriptions and great pictures. 
Um, so I'll I'll send that to Rachel so that you can share that if you want. Yeah, absolutely. I'll get that out in my um, monthly email correspondence to everybody. Justine, I have another question coming in that says, do you have suggestions for moving laneways to let them rest? Horses and goats, um, horses do a lot of damage to my lanes. <clears throat> to the laneways? Yep, yep. It yeah. says, do you have suggestions for moving laneways to let them rest? Um, I actually don't have experience moving and changing lane laneways, actually. The the farms that I've worked with tend to keep it um, and they haven't rotated them. But now that I think about it, especially with horses, I could definitely see that where things just maybe turn muddy or rocky. Um, I'm not sure. I, I suppose trying to get anything to grow back after the laneway could be a little bit tricky. Um, my suggestion would be to, to try to improve the laneway that you've already got, uh, whether that means throwing down you know, soil on top of it or gravel or, well, maybe not gravel, um, but some maybe mulch or something, something to try to fill it in. Uh, but the laneways, that, that does bring up a good point actually that I didn't mention is that maintaining laneways and roadways is important for animal welfare as well. And that, um, and I've seen this a lot on Irish dairy farms even, um, is that when laneways are not properly upkept or kept up, um, that you can have a higher incidence of lameness and especially on in situations like maybe horses or dairy animals where they're going to be coming in and out and utilizing that laneway a lot. Um, if it's, uh, if it's causing them to become lame, whether they're turning, um, you know, a hoof or they're um, getting small stones embedded into their hooves or something like that, then that can be a problem. So um, I would say probably just keep up with the laneway that you have, I don't think I would suggest moving it just because I think that would be wasted area that will not end up growing back anything in a timely manner for the person. So maybe, yeah, throwing down some kind of material mulch or something like that, that'll um, try to improve the laneway, I suppose. All right, I'm not seeing any other questions come through. So I think at this point, we'll wrap up for the day. Um, again, thank you, Justine, for, for being our the second speaker today. Um, before we all end and head off and do all the other things on our agenda, um, if we could just go back to that slido.com. Uh, again, Mackenzie has um, put that link into the chat section for us. There's a series of five questions for our um, post evaluation today. Uh, and I appreciate you taking the time to fill that out. Uh, that will help me provide the, the information that I need to share so that we can continue these workshops and programs for you all. So uh, with that, I'm going to wrap up, but I do hope that if you have any questions or want to reach out further, uh, you feel free to do so. Uh, you can email me at any time. I'm always available. Um, and again, we are moving our April 6th workshop to much the same fashion, a webinar, uh, and there will be more information to come on that as uh, we continue. All right. Well, thank you very much, everybody.